Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Mid Earth of the Land of the Lord of the Rings, the Tolkien Legendarium. Um, and I have got a special guest. I'm trying to do this all the way through when we're looking at the, uh, the, the history of Middle Earth, trying to introduce you to some of the fantastic content creators that there are in, in the world of Tolkien and Middle Earth. And today um, I have got Lexi, Girl Next Gondor. Do you want to say hi? I will say hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Excellent. A good start. Why don't you just uh, say who, who you are, what your channel is, uh, just a little bit of introduction like that. Um, yes. So my story is uh, probably has a lot in common with a lot of people watching. Uh, I read The Hobbit, I think, when I was in fifth grade for the first time. I adored it. I really appreciated how Tolkien seemed, even at that age, I could sense that he was taking this more seriously than other sort of light children's fantasy authors that I'd read up to that point. So my parents got me the box set of Lord of the Rings. It was not the movie tie-in version, but only, <laughs> I, I missed that cutoff by about a year. Um, I tried to read Fellowship of the Ring, and I got bogged down consistently every time in the Council of Elrond, which, no shade, Council of Elrond is my favorite chapter, but I give everyone permission to skip it their first time through. Uh, it took me five or six kind of running starts to get through the Council of Elrond. I was actually locked in a car with none of my other books to hand and only a Fellowship of the Ring, so that's what got me through it, and then it was I was gone. That was it. Um from then, it was on to Two Towers and Return of the King, finished by the end of the week, Silmarillion for my birthday, and then a nerdy little childhood of crawling through thrift stores trying to gather the histories of Middle-earth bit by bit and reading the letters, and I just had kind of always kept up with it. And about a year ago, I started talking about, talking about and thinking about starting a Tolkien YouTube channel, and so I kind of threw my hat in the ring and made a couple videos, and it was really fun, and I got a really great response, and I got to meet a lot of cool people like yourself and a bunch of other, like Helen, I've I've had Helen on my channel, I've been on her channel a few times, I've been on Mr. Scott's channel, so it's been a delightful journey, and I'm just kind of excited to see what's next. Excellent. Well, what's next, I'm sure, is is huge growth for you. You do some fantastic videos. If anyone would like to, and I would highly encourage you to, uh, check out uh, the channel, Girl Next Gondor. There is a link down in the description, I suspect. If you're uh, watching this live, then the moderators, uh, hello moderators, you do fantastic work. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have already put links there in the live chat. Um, what I try to do... Uh, at the top of all of these live streams is just to uh, very quickly go over some of the news, the fantasy news that we've had uh, through the last week. I think there are two things I want to quickly talk about before we get into the first age, which is what we're looking at for most of this live stream. The first thing is that we've had our first clip from The Wheel of Time, which is coming out next month. And uh, we've had a trailer, a teaser trailer already, but this time we had a, a proper minute, minute and a half worth uh, of actual footage um it's looking good it's looking very sharp um uh, and uh, we get for those who know it this is the, the entrance of rain and lan uh, as they're, they're coming into the two rivers and into the tavern and it's uh, it's looking good so far um i'm still holding uh, holding back judgment waiting for the the full trailer to uh, um uh, to emerge uh, but lexi are you uh, are you a wheel of time person have you seen this uh, this clip it actually I'm. I haven't seen the clip. I'm aware that it's. I'm aware of it. That's unfortunately that's where my knowledge of this particular universe ends. I had a few friends a few years back recommend that I should start to read Wheel of Time and get into it. I've heard the the Amazon hype, obviously, but I realized that there were a lot, like a lot of books, and I felt like to do it justice, I was going to have to commit to reading all of those books. And with my current to be read list already more than I could manage. I thought to myself, I should, I should wait. I should step back. <laughs> That's understandable. Uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot of books there. It's a huge series. I think it's 15. I always lose count. Um, and it's, they're all big chunky stories. But what I would say is that season one is only going to cover uh, book one, 
a bit of book two and I think probably a tiny bit of book three. So if you are just wanting to read some of it, then just to get that's, into those first That's an books. excellent point. That might be the impetus I need to at least go <laughs> along with the series and keep up. Fantastic. Um, if you're interested in that clip, if you check out my Twitter, I, I, uh, I think I retweeted it there. It was a few days ago now, but you will find it there. The other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, which I'm sure you will have thoughts on, is uh, an interview that came out, uh, I think it was on Sunday morning uh, here in the UK, with Lenny Henry. Now, Lenny Henry, for those who don't know, uh, he's very famous here in the UK. He was a stand-up comedian, is now an actor, done, done some amazing charity work. And importantly for us, he is an actor in the Lord of the Rings on Prime TV show when it happens. And there was this... 30 seconds of a much more sort of wide-ranging discussion across a number of different issues. He gave a few details about what was uh, what the experience was. Um, and the thing which people have really picked up on is the fact that he said that he's playing a half-foot hobbit. Um, now, this is confusing for many of us because... Amazon have introduced the whole series as Welcome to the Second Age. Then they gave us a picture from the Years of the Trees, which is thousands of years before that. Then we hear from, and I think I don't think Lenny Henry was winding us up. I think he genuinely is. He's he's probably the kind of person who's probably just sort of uh, going off script a little bit here. He probably wasn't supposed to say that, but I don't don't doubt that that he's who he says he was. A Hobbit, as far as we're aware, is a. Th they only really appeared in the Third Age. So, what's what's your thoughts on this? What do, what what do you think's going on here? So, I understand that uh, Lenny Henry's sincerity in this interview and and how much of it was approved by Amazon. That's something that's kind of been called into question. I like you, and I'm inclined to mostly believe that what he's saying is what he believes to be the truth. Um, I've read too many interviews with Lord of the Rings actors during the, the Jackson trilogy years to th fool myself into think thinking that every single actor who's involved in a major project like this has a really acute overview of the details of the geography and the timeline that they're working with. You know, obviously they'd be more interested in their particular character and their arc. So... At the same time, this seems to heavily suggest hobbits. It seems to suggest hobbits in the Second Age, which is not anti-canon. It's just sort of a-canonical. We know that hobbits would probably have had to exist. It's just unclear what exactly, if anything, they would have been doing and if they would be more a more nomadic people. He mentions that they live in the Shire. I, I think at one point he says he's a hobbit of the Shire, and I don't know. He may not know that the Shire is a specific locale that has a specific history and a and a start date that would be in the third age so i tend to think that the major discrepancies are just a product of this being again an off-the-cuff interview from an actor who's focused on his character and trying to explain his character to a general audience it would be I, i'm not entirely opposed to the idea of some kind of hobbit presence in the second age uh, I'm very curious to see, I guess, how it will play out with the larger narrative of what's going on. Yeah, I think I would agree with pretty much all of that. If you listen to the, the interview, it was it was a very it was a very relaxed, just sort of a chat. If you don't right. know the the, the, the program, British people may know that the, the program on Sunday mornings on it's on Radio Four is a very sort of relaxed kind of atmosphere. And he was talking about something completely different and just sort of riffed into this. Um, and it was I. I think I would agree with you. He's not a Tolkien scholar. Um, when he talks about the Shire, I think he's just talking uh, just from his general knowledge of Lord of the Rings rather than he's been told that he comes from the Shire. Um, I suspect he talks about an, an indigenous people. I wonder whether he meant an itinerant people. Um, so there's there, there are a lot of things there that I it may be just that it was just the language was slightly... Uh, we, we read in too much into this to what, looking for specifics. Um, and I think I would agree the fundamental point here, as you say, that if this is second age, Hobbits being there is not anti-canon in my view. 
Uh, it's not, there's nothing that says that there, there were no hobbits there. Uh, it's just that we start reading about them, hearing about them in the third age. So that's the, that's where the sort of the, the fuzziness is. And we've heard about this a few different times from different angles. I think Tom Shippey talked about this actually ages ago. He said that they can, as far as the, the Tolkien estate is concerned, uh, then as long as you don't go against canon, there's huge amounts of wide area where you can you can explore, and this I don't I don't think this is against canon. We'll we'll have to wait and see, but I don't think so. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move on, and we're we're talking today um, uh, about the first age. I want to just very quickly had a few super chats just before uh, we'll get into this. Callum Barnes saying, "Keep up the Lord of the Rings live streams. Don't worry, I will." Uh, first age might just be my personal favourite. So many tragic stories for the race of men. Um, yeah, and and for the elves as well. It's quite a tragic uh, age, as we will get into. Um, uh, Britt Logan, a very generous super sticker. Thank you very much. Uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara, saying to Robert and your guest, Girl Next Gondor, just a show of love, appreciation, and support for all the fabulous Lord of the Rings content on both your channels. Thank you. Um, and uh, Aaron Strever saying, hello, Robert and Girl Next Gondor. I hope you're doing well. Question is, who is your favourite person from each race uh, Valar and Maya included. Well, I mean, let's go. With, let, let's pick a couple of races. Who's your um, Who's your favourite elf, and who's your favourite human, or uh, your Valar? Or, yeah, who's your favourite Valar? Wait. Who's your favourite elf? Okay, my favourite Valar is Melkor. He's my boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. And my, I don't know if I can pick a favourite elf. Um, uh. Oh yes, do half elves count? I mean, I guess it depends. Spoilers elf. for maybe later in this whether they chose to be an elf uh, or a human. You no, know, he's no, he's yeah, he's <laughs> he's he's a Lord of the Rings half elf. His El Elrond's it's... probably my my top character ever, so I would I would give him probably favorite elf status. Fantastic. I mean, I I think Elrond is is great. I think um, in terms of valor, I think. My favorite Valor is probably Ulmo. I, I get very, very I, popular. Well, it's because he's the only one who's actually good, <laughs> in my yeah. view. He's he he's just the the Valar as a whole do abandon elves and humans, and it's explicitly said he's the one who didn't. And I, and I, I have like very, very complicated thoughts about the Valar. On the one hand, I really feel for their situation. I think a lot of people write them off prematurely but on the other hand yeah they make some colossal mistakes in my opinion they they do indeed and but I, I think that the main thing for me is the fact that they just just back away <laughs> for, for a very long time at the end of it and we'll get into that this is they i really think do. one of the key themes in the first age is that they they do just back off in the first age this is no longer a battle between the valar and melkor morgoth this is that the, they've left them to it. Apart from uh, our hero Ulmo, of course, who, who <laughs> still stays involved. But um, the, the most of the rest of the, the Valar do not uh, get involved at all. Um, and then there was one other question that I think is going to be right up your alley. This is Lyle uh, Lyle Hammack. Um, uh, hi there, Lyle. I got your questions over on Patreon as well, saying, "Could you explain the houses of Gondolin? How many there were?" and uh, what uh, they actually were. They don't seem like family houses. Uh, so just context first, Gondolin, a secret city. This was a city of elves. This was a place where they hid from Morgoth uh, deep in the mountains. Uh, and having been founded, we don't know huge amounts of the details of the ins and outs of exactly how it worked, but there were, I think, 12 different houses and they each had heads. Uh, and uh, Lexi, do you want to give us a bit more about that? I will do my best. So the Houses of Gondoline, as I recall, are only really mentioned in the Fall of Gondoline, the early versions. I don't think they're, I, I think a couple of them may be referenced in the Silmarillion, but I don't believe they're all listed. So there's the King's House, Torgon who I believe he's represented by the scarlet heart of his father, which is kind of morbid, but okay, Turgon, go on. Um, 
Tuor is the white wing, Maeglin is the mole, Salgant is the harp, Salgant is the lord of the harp, so I'm I'm going, I think I'm going lord and then name of the house. Uh, I believe Dwilin is the swallow, Egelmoth is the heavenly arch, Pengoloth gets both the pillar and the tower. We have, obviously, Glorfindel with the golden flower and Ecthelion with the fountain. I'm too off. What are they? <laughs> Give me a moment. Um, okay, tree is Galdor, and then hammer is so so Galdor is the lord of the house of the tree, and rogue is the hammer of wrath. So you're right; they don't really seem like families. We don't know a lot about the political structure specifically in Gondolin. It's a weird situation because it's got a lot of Noldor in it. Obviously, it was founded by Turgon, who's a Noldoran king. But there's also a good amount of Sindar and even just random Sylvan elves who followed Torgon and founded Gondolin with him. Uh, and Maeglin, of course, is like half Avari, half Noldor. So he's he's a whole problem in himself on multiple levels. So I think probably we're talking, because in the fall of Gondolin, it's the houses rally to a specific lord, and those are sort of the military detachments. And for example, uh, I think the, the House of the Swallow, they tend to be more lightly armed. House of the Hammer of Wrath, obviously big maces and war hammers, and um, tend to do a, a very heavily armed, a lot of smithing. So I believe it's almost a, a polit political slash military division. I don't know if the economic factors would enter into it at all, uh, but it's this is Tolkien at some of his earliest, most sort of mythic fairy tale kind of writing. So I don't know if he really had a strong view on what the houses of Gondolin represented. I think he was kind of more in his right brain imaginative mode when he was writing the Book of Lost Tales. So I don't know if we'll ever really have an answer. I don't know. I don't know if Tolkien would have had an answer, but he probably would have come up with one if you had asked him. <laughs> I'm sure he would. I mean, I, I think. Uh, well, firstly, uh, that was very impressive, um, and this is why. This is why I'm I have impressed. You on here. It's been a long uh, time you, since I read that. You should definitely be uh, be impressed. Uh, we've had, and um, not just me. Men of the West is in the chat. Hi, hi there. Great to uh, Joyston. Uh, one of the OGs, the, the the YouTuber that we all look up to, the the, the Lord of the Rings YouTubers. Lord of the Rings YouTuber, um, but uh, even he was impressed by that. So um, I, I think I would agree. I don't think I've got huge amounts to, to add to that. The only thing that I just would sort of speculatively say is that one of the things about Gondolin is, is uh, it does have a lot of this kind of circular imagery about within this sort of circle of mountains. And so we have having the 12 houses does kind of make this kind of feel to me like almost like a clock face that kind of feel Ooh. and and i i just i've always that's just a gut instinct I, I don't think there's anything written down by talking on this one but that's the kind of feel i have it's almost as if they're as you said they don't seem to be families as if they're they're in charge of this area here they're in charge of that area there that would be my guess uh because there's definitely you know there's a central market was it mm -hmm. in segments it's possible i don't know that's that's a bit of speculative or bit of tinfoil stuff from me there or rings ascending, kind of like Minas Tirith. Exactly. That's that's the, the the feel is very much that kind of circular feel uh, going on there. Um, okay. Anyway, good uh, good question, uh, Lyle. We've got some more from you coming up. What I thought I'd do now is we if we get into the the first age, and I thought I'd do a sort of an overview of what the first age is, trying to sort of condense this down in just a, a few minutes. Uh, but I should probably just do uh, a sort of a cavil on chronology, as they say. Uh, the First Age, there's not 100% agreement amongst scholars about what actually counts as the First Age. What I'm considering being the First Age as being the, the, after the sun was created and that that's the, a new uh, era of time effectively happened. But there are points at which Tolkien kind of hinted that he counted it as going all the way back into the years of the trees, uh, which was when we had those two trees in Valinor providing the light. Uh, but for this, the sake of this, we'll talk mainly about that era, which is the Silmarillion, the main, the Quinta Silmarillion, the big bulk uh, of, of the 600 years or so that mm -hmm. is described in the, the main part of the Silmarillion. So... Just by way of build up to this, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, if you'll allow me, Lexi, I'll do my, my few minute overview. And then if you just uh, 
highlight a few things that you think I've clearly forgotten and should have mentioned. Um, that would be great. Um, the the build up to this we talked about last time was that we had uh, Morgoth who had uh, been imprisoned, had escaped. He'd done the nasty with uh, Un Ungoliant. They come and they killed the trees. Uh, and this had created this huge chain of events uh, that uh, the light went out. Everywhere was plunged into darkness. The Valar say, hey, can we have the Silmarils? Feanor, this great elf, had created the Silmarils, which had captured the light of the trees. And he goes, no, you're not having them. Uh, this is these are my masterworks. Uh, I won't be able to remake them. Um, and then he heads off, uh, having found out that Morgoth not only has he killed the trees, but he's also captured the Silmarils and killed Fëanor's father. Fëanor, in a huge mad rage, then charges off to Middle Earth with his people, the Noldor. Some of them very much on his side, some of them slightly more begrudgingly because they just sworn an oath of fealty and they, they feel they ought to, to, to follow him, even if they're not really on his team. Um, the, the arrival of them in Middle-earth is then the sort of the start of this first age proper. The, the Noldor, their Feanorian Noldor, because they kind of break up quite, quite quickly, him and his sons immediately try and get the Silmarils back. It's quite um, it's hard to see, with, to be sure whether this is just pure arrogance or just something you should admire, but he just decides to head straight for, for Angband and go to find the, the most powerful created building, uh, being in the entire uh, world and, and demand his, uh, his jewels back. Uh, he doesn't make it there. He gets separated from everyone, basically surrounded by Balrogs and is killed. But his sons are still wanting the Silmarils. And this is the framing thing for, for all of the First Age, really, is the, the Feanor's sons wanting to get those Silmarils back. And a huge amount of this First Age, there's a sort of a really kind of a, a loose siege going on around Angband, which is where Morgoth is, which is where the, he's got the Silmarils. And things are going on around the outside, um, that are actually quite important. But at the end of it all, we get the breakout from the siege. And uh, and that's when Morgoth, who spent all this time, who knew, building up a massive army, came out uh, and started attacking everyone and winning. The things which are going on in the background, which are actually quite important, are the coming of men. Humanity arrives uh, and they start, some of them start drifting westwards, start coming into the part of Middle Earth that we know, uh, encountering the elves. Uh, and we get houses called the Edine, who later turn into the Numenorians. Um, there's some fantastic characters there. And we get three epic stories. We get uh, the Beren and Luthien, uh, star-crossed lovers, uh, one man, one elf, and they manage to capture a Silmaril. Um, we get the children of Hurin, a tragedy, basically, um, uh, that is, in many ways, it's quite sort of long-winded, uh, but it's also very uh, focused just in on these two children and the horrendous things that they go through. Um, and then we get the fall of Gondolin, this secret city that uh, at the end very near the end of the age, finally falls. Once the, the forces of evil come out from Angband, Morgoth's forces uh, come forward, and he's by this time he's got not just orcs and balrogs, but he's also got dragons as well. They come out ta taking on all of Middle-earth, basically. And finally we get a call for help. Erendil, uh, this great mariner, heads off with the Silmaril, finds his way over to Valinor, and finally the Valar accept his, the fact he's begging them to come and help out. They send a force over, Morgoth is finally defeated, and that's the end of the First Age. So that's my high-level um, summary of the First Age. It's between the coming of the Noldor Elves uh, and the defeat of Morgoth. 
uh, Lexi, you, I have clearly missed out huge amounts here, but what, what are the things that you would sort of highlight that, that uh, you want to add to that? Well, actually, congratulations, because if I were trying to give, I had to make sure before I started this, that if I were asked to give a summary of the first stage, that it would be under 20 minutes. And so, <laughs> so I think you've actually hit without getting too deep into the details, like, for example, the actual events of the Baron and Luthien story, or exactly like why Turin matters, because all he does is ruin his own life, right? Well, no, he actually ruins everyone else's life. I think the only thing that is useful to know that is super easy to miss, but it kind of affects things later on, is the existence of Thingol and Doriath that predate the Noldor returning to Middle-earth. So Thingol is a Sindarin elf. He did not, he originally crossed over to Valinor, looked around, brought word back to his people, said, yeah, the Valar are pretty cool, Valinor's pretty sweet, we should go. But Along the way, he gets distracted. He falls in love with a sort of rogue female Maya named Melian, who's a very powerful force for good. She's one of the few, if if not the only Maya who is still hanging around in Middle-earth. They actually fall in love, and Thingol and Melian, their child is Luthien, who's very important later on. And they have a kingdom in the sort of middle of the continent of Valerian that is besieged kind of by Morgoth when the Noldor show up. So a good deal of the First Age references this idea that there is this hidden kingdom of Doriath that's ruled by Thingol and protected by Melian. And no one, not even elves, can really get in or out without permission. And Thingol has taken a very isolation, isolationist stance, which is understandable because, I mean, Morgoth, right, this is the only way he's been able to survive, is by just locking everyone out. So... That is some, So that's why it's easy to overlook Thingol, because most of what he does is just kind of sit there. But he sits there very significantly. So he does. And, and, yeah. and, and it's, he sits there very significantly is, is probably yeah. a good way of summarizing. He, he is almost the central figure through all of this, is that you get the, you get the sons of Feanor who are all fire and bluster and trying to get the Silmarils back. Um, you get lots of... Uh, heroic uh, human characters who sort of appear, but they're obviously only here for short periods of time. Uh, and you obviously have the great antagonist there in Morgoth. But as the kind of the central character, Thingol, he ties all of this together. He's there beforehand. So when the Noldor arrive, he's already there. Um, and so many of these stories, Beren and Luthien, um, uh, the children of Huron, a lot of these stories weave in and around him. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really good call, I think, to, to put him there as sort of this, this central figure. Um, I've just put up, um, actually, I just saw a voice of geekdom in the chat. Hi there, Dan. Uh, great to see you. Um, I've put up in uh, a map uh, on the, the screen uh, right now, which... Um, I think a lot of people, and I had a question uh, from one of my patrons um, from uh, Catherine Furseth saying, I'm always a bit confused by the shifting and disappearing regions and continents in Tolkien's world. For example, Beleriand during the First Age. Can you please give a brief overview? Um, this is a map that we've got from uh, someone called Karen Wynne Fonstad, who copied... Uh, a lot of Tolkien's maps, and they these are quite old, these maps now, uh, but they're generally still considered pretty much the gold standard. There's no, there are some things people dispute, but as maps go, they're, they're up there. So what we've got here, this is First Age Middle-earth, First Age Beleriand, the bit that we're really interested in. Uh, and it's worth saying, yes, the, the world shifts a lot in in in, in the history of Arda. Uh, the world at this point, um, it's still uh, a, there's got the second continent across. It's still flat. There's a second co continent across to the west. Uh, in terms of the things to note here, is that if you look uh, at the top left of this map, then you'll see sort of icy wastes sort of disappearing off to your left. Uh, that's the Helcaraxa. That is where the bulk of the Noldor, not Feanor and his sons, but the bulk of the Noldor, people like 
Galadriel, for example, Finrod, they came over that way through the ice. This was a horrendous journey for them. Lots of them died. If you look, if you look towards the top middle, you'll see a range of mountains, um, uh, and that is Angband. So uh, what you've got is uh, Thongorodrim. Uh, the three, you've got the three mountains there uh, that you can see slightly darker. This is the base of um, uh, Morgoth uh, underneath there. And if you go head down south the, uh, further, there's a sort of a greyish area. Uh, and that greyish area is Doriath, around which is the Girdle of Melian. So that, and that is where Thingol was based. Are there any other areas on there, Lexi, do you think it's worth just sort of pointing out to, uh, just to give people a little bit of a, a, a grasp on what's going on? The big, thing, the big thing that I like to point out is that mountain range uh, to the far east, the very rightmost edge, those are the Blue Mountains. So that for me, because the shifting lands between the first and the second and the third age, like this is something that gets me every time I'm always referring back to this map and the ones in Lord of the Rings and ones online and all kinds of things to just try and get a sense of place. But those mountains going up and down on the right are the Blue Mountains, the Eridluin. And if you think about the third age, the Shire is right to the right of those. It's right to the west of those. And they're kind of broken up and softened it the point of the third age because all of this is going to sink pretty much with the blue mountains being the line uh everything west of which gets drowned essentially so that's kind of my little reference point for okay you know they're running around in thargelion and then you know, some of them are up in hithloom and all that and then oh yeah and all of this is going to get drowned eventually and what's going to be left for the new start for the second age survivors is everything east of the blue mountains yeah, I think that's a really, uh, really good point to make. That um, the we often try and I often have people sort of say, "So, how does this map across to the map that we know?" And the short answer is, it doesn't. Is so. Mm -hmm. Don't try and have a look and say, "Okay, so, so Doriath there, where is is that? What is that? The Shire? Where is that in Reddit?" So, just imagine this as being a completely different map. Uh, as you say, it's sort of all underwater pretty much all of it are underwater by the time we get to the third age of the, the stories that we know the best so um yeah it's good to good to have this good to get an understanding of what it, it's uh what where the different things are the other thing actually i just uh, thought is that if you if you look at um that gray bit doriath um and then you sort of head north west sort of uh, north northwest of that you will see some sort of a circularish mountain range that's where the hidden city is so um that's that's where we're looking there it's all most of the action is is in quite a contained area um okay a few uh, super chats just to quickly work through um uh let's have a quick i'm pretty sure i had some <laughs> always try and catch up so Lyle Hammock again thank you very much saying another question I have noticed that there is a level of brutality in the first and second age like Sauron torturing and killing Gorlim the story of Turin or Caleb Limbor's death uh Caleb I always mispronounce his name uh I have to say it's and I always blame my dad for who mispronounced it when he was teaching me about Tolkien Dad never watches these, so I, I can get away with blaming him. Um, nice. Why did Tolkien sanitize the Third Age? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think for, for me, whether he sanitized the Third Age, I, I think it's more The Hobbit is a children's book. So he obviously wasn't going to be writing huge amounts of um, torture scenes in a children's book. Uh, and The Lord of the Rings, we focus a lot more on... The, the good guys, the heroes. We don't we don't read in huge amounts of detail about how um, Gollum was tortured in Mordor or any of these other kind of... There were gruesome and horrible things that happened, but they're more off screen. So I don't think he it's a sanitize, an attempt to sanitize things. Um, but, I mean, I don't know, Lex, did you have a thought on this one? Yeah, I think I agree. I don't know that I would call it a sanitization. There are Tolkien's never going to really get graphic with what goes on. Even the 
more appalling events of the second and first stage are described in very high level, you know, Celebrimbor gets shot full of arrows and put on a pike and his body is used as a banner. Like, that's horrible, but we don't get a description of the blood running down. We don't get a blow by blow of it happening. We just get told that it happens. I think the difference, one of the differences is the time scale. So the Lord of the Rings covers a tiny part of the War of the Ring. It's it's about a year long that they're covering the time period and they are following very specifically some POV characters who go through horrific things. They, some of the stuff that Frodo goes through in Mordor in particular is pretty brutally described. Boromir's death is not dwelt upon, but it's not sanitized. It's pretty gnarly. So I think one of the problems here is that in the first stage, everyone who has something particularly bad happen to them, which is everyone in the first age, they all get mentioned in the span of three or four pages because we're covering centuries and decades very, very quickly. And so we're just getting fire hosed with horrible negativity. Whereas in the Lord of the Rings, it is a novel. We have POV characters and we only hear about the bad things specifically that happened to those characters over the course of the year, which for me was plenty. It's not, not a cheery read. No, absolutely. So I, th I think I would, I would, I would agree with that. And it's not a, um, yeah, it, it, I don't think it's a sanitizing uh, thing. Um, uh, non Cal saying, question for you both: What's your favorite first age story that's not part of the main narrative of the Silmarillion? Um, as with Bombadil, most of my favorite Tolkien stories are when you're getting sidetracked with him. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I know what you mean with Tom Bombadil. Is is complete departure from the main story mm -hmm. um but um I, I think well i'd well, i'd probably say first of all on this one I, I don't think that there is and i think this is perhaps why a lot of people struggle a little bit with the silmarillion i don't think there is a narrative an overarching narrative to the Silmarillion. It's not a long story. The Quintus Silmarillion, the first story of the first age, is not a long story. Yes, we can sort of give an overview of it, but it's lots of different lives that are just intersecting each other at different points. So um, I think that's the first thing. But in terms of sort of little um, uh, moments, I, 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 mean, I love the, the coming of the Noldor. I just think that this, this it feels completely game-changing. This is... Uh, Feanor is the protagonist par excellence that Tolkien created. Everything just happens as a result, folds out because of what he did. Galadriel wouldn't have been there, but for him, uh, then you try and look, look and say, well, what would, what would have happened if the Noldor hadn't turned up? Probably Morgoth would have been able to sort of like expand out sooner. What, what if uh, uh, we, what would happen with the humans coming in? That the, you, the moment you start asking all these questions, you think actually fan or bringing the Noldor over is um, astonishing. Um, I think the only other the thing which immediately springs to mind is the story of Mim, the petty dwarf. <laughs> I've I've always it just it hits me on so many levels because it's it's a sad story for those who don't know it. He he's the the, the last effectively of his race, sort of a, one of the dwarf. Uh, clans effectively which had been hunted to extinction basically by the elves um and uh then he's there and he's sort of hiding out in his cave and he's caught by characters that we're sort of we like to think of as heroes Turin, uh, Beleg, i think and it's mm -hmm. like they basically just make him a captive in his own home um and so suddenly we're going are these actually good guys uh, and then he kind of like turns on them and they go, but I don't like what he did either. And it's just like, it's, it works for me on so many different levels. I feel sad and sorry about the whole situation. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, do you have any sort of like side stories or bits that you love? There's a couple. So like you said, the really the frame for the first stage is the Noldor are trying to defeat Morgoth and Morgoth is trying to defeat the Noldor and everyone else is just sort of sucked into that. So there's no really, everything takes place within that context. So there can't be a side story because any story that takes place is naturally affected by this ongoing conflict. But as for things that are not 
the great tales and kind of little side moments or incidents. I really like Helleth. That's the the more I read about that story and the situation and kind of piece it together now that I'm not just struggling to keep all the names and rivers straight in my head now that I can really start to appreciate what the politics of the situation are. I really like the interaction between Helleth and Caranthir. And I really like Tour. I think people sleep on him because before he makes it to Gondolin, of course, once he makes it to Gondolin, he gets taken up into the grand narrative. He becomes fated and his son becomes his heir Endil, who becomes the star. But Tour, before he even decides to try and find Gondolin, is a super cool character. He's raised by a wandering tribe of Grey Elves. He eventually goes to them and says, look, I need to leave and go pursue my destiny and that kind of stuff. And his foster father is, says, okay, good luck with that, I guess. It's probably not going to end well. He gets taken captive. He is a slave, essentially, for three years. And he escapes. This is my favorite because, and I think this might only be an unfinished tale, so I guess technically not canon if you want to make that distinct that distinction i i, I count unfinished tales as close uh, as it's, canon as makes it's no really difference. close um so he escapes because he dogs are sent after him to try and hunt him and basically tree him and bring him back and he's friends with the dogs because he was nice to them and he fed them so <laughs> when they find him <laughs> they give him doggy kisses and he tells them go home and they run home and that's how he manages to escape is because he was nice to dogs and tour is a dog person so that is, I have a dog. It's a moment very close to my heart where he tells them, okay, good boys, run home. And they do because Tour is awesome like that. And I think people don't give him enough respect. Uh, no, I, and I, I, yes, I agree. It's a, it's a good, I'm also a dog person. So yes, very <laughs> I, I, do, I do like that. Um, although I, I don't think if I told my dog to run home, he'd know at all where to go. <laughs> it's a little bit ditzy. Anyway, um, uh, Zenoir, thank you so much uh, for the super chat there didn't see a question attached to that one but thank you um glenn thrasher no question i only wanted to thank idg and girl next gondor for excellent talking content well on oh. behalf of us both thank you um uh Strillian saying what are your respective views on curdan as he seems to be continually overlooked but he is there from start to finish um uh well so curdan is uh he's Elf, he's he. We do see him actually in uh, the Lord of the Rings. He's the guy who's sort of the very end uh, with the boat that's about to set off to Valinor. He's just like there ushering people on, and that is pretty much what he was doing for thousands of years. Uh, just sort of, uh, he stayed there at the Grey Havens. Uh, he was uh, the shipwright. He welcomed people like Gandalf when they arrived. In fact, he gave Gandalf his ring. Um, uh, the the ring of fire um and he is uh wise and he is far sighted uh so in terms of my views on him he's one of my favorite elves he doesn't really get involved in huge amounts of action but he seems to know what his role is and he seems to stick with it for a, a very long time are there any sort of uh, bits of kurdan's nature that you sort of picked up on other than him clearly sticking to his role the thing that I enjoy most about Círdan is that when Thingol, before the Noldor show up, or as they're just really beginning to show up, when Morgoth makes this great bursting forth from Angband for the first time, really seriously attacking the elves who are dwelling in Beleriand after centuries of mostly being quiet and staying behind his mountains... Thingol has to make this decision where he's going to have his magical wife fence off his land, and Thingol has been the nominal ruler of the Sindar, the Grey Elves, and all the other Lyquendi and Falathrim and random Teleran tribes and Avari that are all kind of floating around, having ultimately decided not to travel to Valinor. They all kind of kind of own Thingol, Elu Thingol as their king, but it's a very loose kingship. You get the sense that a lot of these green elven and Teleran tribes don't really want a structured political system. So they say, oh yeah, Thingol's the king, and if he ever tells us to do anything, I suppose we'll listen, but he's not gonna because he knows better. So Thingol decides that he's going to have to fence off his realm, and he kind of lets it be known that anyone who's not within the borders of Doriath is going to be locked out and will not be allowed back in. 
And so Círdan by default becomes the ruler of the Philothrium in the west and also any random tribes from Osirian who get fed up with wandering and dodging orc patrols and kind of want to settle down or maybe get some protection, they pretty much have to apply to Círdan. So he's kind of this anti-Thingle. He stays in the world and he finds himself in a position where he's ruling the rest of the the Moriquindi, the Dark Elves in Valerian, kind of just by default, he sort of falls into it. And I really like that about him. I also like the fact that Gilgalad, the last eye king of the Noldor, kind of grows up in the in that area under Círdan's guidance. Now, Gilgalad's parentage in early life is a very controversial topic. There's about five different versions. They're all very vague. We don't know a lot about it. But I like the idea that Círdan is kind of offering refuge and maybe giving some pointers to this young, confused 16th in line for the throne, Noldoran heir, who ends up being the the High King of the Noldor in in, uh, Middle-earth with the longest reign. So arguably one of the most successful. Yes, and as uh, Reflective Rambling in the chat points out, and the only elf with a beard... Um, I, that we know of. That we know, well, that we wait, know there's, of. There's Matan yeah. too, but we'll get into that. Yeah. So, so he's um, his his beard is described as long, uh, which is quite an interesting. Rather than, huh, it's an elf with a beard. It's the fact that it's described as long seems to imply that there must be other elves with beards. But it shows quite how old he is because he's got such an impressive beard. Um, question from uh, Cloaked Juan. Uh, thank you very much uh, for picking up, as you always do. Thank you. A uh, question from for somebody else. This is for uh, Kaziglu Bay. What are the differences between the different groups of elves, i.e. Noldor, Sindarin, etc.? Now, this is exactly why I have Lexi on. I will start you off, um, uh, but it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, the 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 elves, the Quendi, they started off, and we have three groups. Um, uh, and the the three groups um, are the the Banya, the Noldor, and the Teleri. And basically, you can say right off almost immediately, Banya they head off over head west to go to Valinor and stay there. Uh, they make occasional appearances but that there's nothing interesting. They're the good guys. They're the goody goodies. Uh, they go and camp out at the bottom of Manway's mountain and, and mm-hmm. that's it. Um, the, the Noldor are the really interesting ones. They're the ones they do go over. Then Feanor leads them back again. Uh, and you get people like uh, Galadriel's a, a member of, of the Noldor as well. And a lot of what happens uh, as we've already said in the first age, is as a result of what the Noldor were up to. Uh, then you get the Teleri, who are a little bit more complicated because they they headed west, and some of them went, mm, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm going to stay here. Uh, and then they got to the shore, and uh, then their leader went off disappearing. The person who became Dingol, uh, he, he just went off and got... Um, magicked by a, a passing Maya, um, uh, entranced for perhaps millennia, who knows, uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, so they, ha- some of them hung around waiting for their leader to return. Some of them hopped on an island and headed over uh, to Velenor, Um And they sort of like, for quite a long time, didn't actually take the last step. They just sort of said, oh, well, we like this island. Uh, so they get a bit complicated. Uh, after that, it gets even more complicated. Do you want to give us as simple a breakdown as possible about the sort of the next level where the sort of the Sylvan, Sindar, that kind of thing's coming from? I will sure as heck do my best. So the Teleri. So as you said, Vanyar are all in Valinor. Noldor are so such a high proportion of them make it to Valinor that as makes no difference. Noldor, you can count on being all in Valinor. And this, by the way, if you've gone to Valinor and seen the light of the trees, you become a light elf or a Calaquindi, which gives you glowing eyes and mystical powers that are poorly defined. Uh, if you haven't gone to Valinor, you're a Moriquindi. So this is where it gets exciting. 
the Teleri are the third kindred, and half about half of them right off the bat decide we're not going to do it. We don't want to go. We don't even want to start on the journey. So they live in the Far East. They're known as the Avari, the Unwilling. Uh, also, oftentimes just kind of referred to as Dark Elves, even though that's a distinction that can apply more broadly. So we already have a split between the Teleri, the people who... the Teleri means follower. So they're the people who are bringing up the rear of this great migration of elves westward and the Avari who just noped out from the beginning. Then the Teleri get broken into... So different sections of them splinter off as they're crossing the Blue Mountains and uh, going through... A lot of them particularly like the River Syrian, so they decide to stay there. A lot of them particularly like the coast, and they decide to stay there. So we have the Teleri moving westward, the ones who make it to Valinor stay the, called the Teleri. The tribes that break off include the Nandor, which would be green elves, wood elves, sylvan elves. That's what we call in, in The Hobbit or in Lord of the Rings. If you see a reference to sylvan elves, we're talking about the the Lyquendi, the green elves, the Nandor, that kind of thing. There's a bunch of different tribes. Uh, the Philathrim are the ones on the coast, so they're sort of the wave elves. And then the Sindar, very specifically, are the Teleri who are following their king Elu, Thingol. <laughs> Elway, aka Elu, aka Thingol, aka King Grey Mantle. Like he's one of those ones with 15 different names. And the Sindar are the ones who follow Elu Thingol into Doriath and live in Doriath behind the girdle of Melian under Melian's tutelage. So because they are protected and educated by Amaya, who has come out of Valinor and is a good person, you know, not a corrupt one, at least as far as we can tell. And uh, Thingol, their king, is actually, he has been to Valinor, so he is a light elf, even though all of his people haven't made it to Valinor. He, they would be dark elves. So because they are ruled by a light elf king and his angelic magical wife, they have more power, uh, more advanced culture, greater artistic achievement than their kindred outside of the fence. So that's where the, the Cinder and Sylvan distinction comes in. They all kind of become Wood Elves by the end of the Third Age because they all stay behind. They're all very... You know, once Doriath gets, again, sunk under the sea, they're, the distinction kind of ceases to matter as much because they're all intermingling anyway, and they've all decided that they just hate the Noldor and Dwarves, so they unite against them and kind of blend their people, become one people. But the Cinder and Sylvan distinction is the Sindar have more power, have a have more of a civilization, whereas the Sylvan Elves are sort of a loose confederation of primarily nomadic people who don't really ever have a king or a great city or... They, yeah. From the no, very Noldoran perspective that the Silmarillion is written from, they don't seem to achieve that much in the wars in Beleriand. Fantastic. I mean, I thought that was already, uh, it's, uh, it's very complicated and that you could, there are even layers uh, in addition to that, that you could have talked about. Um, but uh, the, 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 I think the basic thing is by the time you get to like the third age, then as you say, they kind of start mingling a bit more. Uh, yes. And so the, the, the boundaries between different types of elves is a lot more blurred earlier on. They, they develop different cultures, they develop different languages even, so it did matter, but sort of later on it mattered a whole lot less. Uh, Lyle Hammock question saying, what is your view on Maeglin? I feel sorry for him, he never really fit in in Gondolin, and his first cousin who he desired came to despise him. No wonder he sold out to Morgoth, especially after he said he could have Idril. Um, yes, yeah, so this is one of the most... Um, Spicy. Complex, spicy. <laughs> uh, let's go with that. Characters. He's um, uh, he he's, he comes to so Gondolin, the secret city, and this is it, it. Has to be said. This is one of the sort of the things that throughout the first age, Morgoth becomes aware of the fact that there is a secret city, um, and he's trying to find it. And he's sort of like you. You see over the the course of years he starts getting more and more clues and he sort of he gets down oh, it's somewhere in this mountain range and and then it's sort of a little bit closer and then um you get i think it was her in shouts at the mountains and he goes ah, it must be over there then uh, mm -hmm. and it's there, there's lots of these different clues start happening the person who is often generally blamed for uh the fall of gondolin finally 
is this guy called Maglin. Um and as you say, Lyle, basically his story, he I means he's got a lot of backstory, but he comes into um, uh, Gondolin and uh, then his, he does, he desires um, uh, his cousin, I think first cousin, um, uh, Idril, and she doesn't really want this. Uh, and he doesn't, as you say, doesn't really fit in. He, he's always like trying really hard to impress, but it doesn't quite work. And eventually he does kind of sell out to Morgoth and uh, sort of reveal where Gondolin is. And he has a horrible death. I think he gets thrown off the walls and bounces three times down the mountain or something. There's some really, really precise detail that Tolkien put in there. Um, we're not supposed to like him, I don't think. Um, Tolkien, I don't think, wants us to like him, but I think he wants us to understand where he came from as a character. He doesn't create this person who's just evil. Um, he he wants us to understand that this comes from a lack within himself, a, a, a desire for something that he can never have. Uh, I mean, does that make sense to you, Lexi, or is there, have you got yeah. a slightly different take? No, I think you've really hit on it with regard to his character. He's kind of a Gollum-like figure in that we are ultimately intended to realize that what he does, he does for all the wrong reasons, and he ultimately is evil. But we understand, I think Mygleen is one of the most clearly defined characters in terms of we know what he was up to for his whole life, and we know what his his family was like and what his motivations were, so it's really kind of tragic how inevitable it seems his eventual turn to Morgoth, which the text makes a big point of saying is he's the only elf known to have willingly worked with Morgoth to try and get something out of it. He wasn't forced into it. He wasn't mentally dominated to the point where he had no choice in the matter he chose to work with Morgoth and that's why his name has gone out in shame and you know he's considered just absolutely untouchable by the the people who survived the fall of Gondolin which was horrible like he really yeah. he really screwed up there but i i think you can sympathize with a character and you can find him an interesting character without condoning his deeds as evil and that's the perspective i take on him i think he's fascinating I think what's interesting to me about Maeglin that people overlook, he doesn't really fit in Gondolin super well, but on certain metrics, he's very successful. He's a accomplished craftsman. He's a great politician. He doesn't talk a lot, but when he does speak, people always stop and listen. He convinces Turgon at several key points in the narrative to lay aside his concerns and kind of go with this alternate plan that Maeglin says, no, this would be better. And Turgon listens to him. Turgon trusts him. He goes to the near Nith Arnoidia, the fifth battle, which was no party. So, so he is, and he's, uh, they also say that he's not a coward. He's not a craven. When he's daunted by Morgoth, it's equal parts his frustration over not being able to inherit the throne and not being able to claim Idril and his, obviously his distaste for the idea of being held in torture for, you know, essentially eternally since he's an elf and he'd be immortal. So he's, he is courageous and he's, a, he does have the trust of the king in a fairly high position within the society of Gondolin, but he can never quite make it work. And it, there's, there's a certain tra tragic element to his character. It, evil. Yeah. Ultimately evil. <laughs> we got to call it, but, but intriguing. Yeah. And I think, I think the other th thing i would sort of say is that we do give him the you know we, we mark him down this is the person who betrayed uh gondolin I, I i think it didn't ultimately maybe this just brought things forward a few years i th i think morgoth would have found it eventually i mean he was like tracking eagles movements and all i mean it, he could he knew roughly where it was and it was just a matter of homing in on it and he would have got there eventually so um, we can give him a bad rap, and we should give him a bad rap. He did we bad should. things, but I, I think to to say that that was the only you know, the only reason Gondolin felt it, no, it, I think it would have done eventually well, anyway. And Ulmo has told Turgon from the very beginning, "Build this city. I will send you a messenger when it's time to abandon it." And he sends him Tour, and Tour says, "Okay, I've 
bear a message from Ulmo the Vala of Waters. And he says, Turgon, remember that thing we talked about? Yeah, bro, it's time. And Turgon says, oh, but my city's so pretty. <laughs> and war, war is so yucky. And I don't want to deal with So Ulmo told them that the city is going to fall. You need to be prepared to leave it behind. So if it wasn't Mygling, it would have been something else, like you said. And Torgon is a little bit culpable here because, like all the Noldor, he loves too well what he has created. He's unwilling to forsake this great feat that he has achieved. And that is what ends up dooming him in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's let's move on from that one. Um, yes. Question, uh, actually, just a very quick question. Um, Mondo uh, Mandevout saying, were the Noldor the most powerful faction? Um, I think this is a really interesting one, which I should just quickly... Uh, answer because um the answer is yes and no i think mm -hmm. in that the they certainly they were the greatest craftsmen uh they had in feanor the most powerful of the of all of the children of luvatar galadriel was the main the second most powerful so they had incredibly powerful people they had great arms and armor uh, when they came across um they we're, we're told they still had the light of valinor in them and they this this gave them extra strength and power. If they had been united, then I think, yes, un un undeniably, apart from possibly Vanya. Uh, but as I say, they're so boring, they never really get involved anyway. Uh, but the Noldor would have been easily the strongest power, but they were never united. They were they were always against each other. So I think it's a, it's a yes and no answer to that one. Um, Reflective Rambling, uh, thank you for picking up question for Estelle, uh, saying from last week, if you didn't catch it, how was the relationship between Elrond and his brother's kin, the Numenorians? Are there any documented interactions where Elros and Elrond close to each other? Well, this is a, obviously this is a second age question, really. Um, Elrond and Elros were born in the first age, and they sort of grew up in the first age, but... Um, at the end of it, right at the end of the first stage, they were given, they were half elven, both of them half elven, and they were given the chance to choose. Do you want to be elf? Do you want to be counted as an elf or a human? Elrond decided to be an elf. His twin brother, uh, Elros, decided to be human. Elros became the first king of Numenor. Um, so uh, in terms of sort of interactions, were they close? Yes, they were twins. They were close. Um, and we're told that uh, Elrond... Uh, certainly much later when you get to the Third Age, at least part of his motivation for sort of caring for uh, the, the new Nord, the, the Dunedain uh, inheritance of Arnor and the, the Rangers in the North was because he had a familial link there through his brother. So yes, they were close. Uh, in terms of documented um, interactions, actually that bit, there's not huge amounts of detail of toing and froing, but the uh, the Numenorians were definitely great seafarers. Is there anything on that you'd want to sort of the Elrond Elros sort of relation that you'd want to pick up on? Yeah, Elrond and Elros, we don't get a lot of interaction between them. Part of that, and this has recently been brought to my attention, one of the YouTube channels, the the Red Book, just did a video on Elrond and Elros and how their evolution in Tolkien's writings was a very complicated one. Originally, they weren't twins and they weren't, they were almost the same character and he later had to split them up because typical Tolkien, he wrote himself into a hole. He couldn't square what he had stated in The Hobbit and the early Lord of the Rings with what his, the later drafts of the Silmarillion were evolving into. So he kind of had to split them up, from what I understand, into a, a pair, one of which would become the father of the Dunedain and the other of which would become an immortal elf that you could say that he was in the First Age and in the Third Age at the same time. So part of, part of the reason I think we don't have a lot about their brotherhood and their relationships since some brothers in and sibling relationships in Tolkien are disproportionately for, focused on. I'm thinking, for example, of Feanor and Fingolfin, or even Manwe and Melkor. Um, but Elrond and Elros kind of became brothers by accident, as it were. And I think it's all that we can kind of infer, which is very sweet, is that Elrond never really abandons his brother's line, even though 
after 50 or 60 or so generations, I mean, can you really say that this person matters to you because he's my 56th times great grand nephew? He, he really, they're indistinguishable, at, almost indistinguishable from just random other men who are not related to you after a certain point. You don't know them any better than you know uh, of Joe Schmo off the street. But Elrond never abandons the idea that his brother's line is going to make good. And at the very end, he handles the whole Aragorn Arwen situation way better, I think, than he's given credit for. If you think that his nearest approximate, the model that he has to go off of here is Thingol. And that is not that is not how we treat our either our human foster sons or our uh, suddenly mortal besmitten daughters. No, although there there, there is one thing which uh, I think for for people who are trying to draw links between the story of the Lord of the Rings and the the Silmarillion, you do get this. So the the Baron and Luthien, this is the uh, mortal man immortal elf falling in love. Uh, can they marry? Well, they ask uh, Luthien's daddy, Thingol. He sets an impossible task. He says, only if you capture me a Silmaril from uh, from Angband, from Morgoth, laughing, thing, thinking, this will never happen. This is impossible. I'm, I'm asking them to do And they do it, of course. Uh, and they are allowed to marry. Uh, and that actually is echoed in what happens with Aragorn and Arwen, because uh, Arwen is is allowed to marry Aragorn when he is the king of both Gondor and Arnor. Now, given the fact that Arnor is a completely disappeared kingdom and Gondor has explicitly many times rejected the idea that the heir of Isildur should be uh, uh, recognised as the king of Gondor, that is also a, a, a near impossible ask. But you do feel that Elrond had some foresight and knew that that was going to happen. Whereas Thingol was just doing it in order to stop a marriage from happening. Yeah, for sure. I think um, Elrond, I think knew that Ar either Aragorn was going to come through and somehow miraculously restore everything and see the overthrow of Sauron or it, nothing was going to matter anyway, because Sauron was going to win. He, he knew, I think, that Aragorn was his last chance. So he said, well, you know, if you win and defeat Sauron, then I guess sure. But I don't know what Elrond thought necessarily his odds of that were. <laughs> um, but, if, but if you don't win, it's not going to matter anyway. No one's getting married. We'll all be dead. So And he also, yeah. I will point this out, Elrond didn't throw Aragorn out or have him bewildered in a maze of enchantment when he confessed that he kind of maybe had eyes for Arwen. Uh, he was like, well, you know, you're still my, my nephew and my brother's heir and you're still important and I've I raised you from a two-year-old. This helps helped your mother raise you so you can continue to stay here. He Aragorn even says to, I think it's to Frodo, when Frodo says, well, do you live in Rivendell? Is that your home? He says, well, I don't really have a home. But the closest thing to it that I have is Rivendell. So so that's nice. I like the fact that Elrond, a little incensed, which is understandable, but instead of going the Thingol route, he does set something of an impossible task, but it's more of an impossible task in the sense that, well, yeah, if we all survive this, which is looking increasingly unlikely, if you can make that happen somehow, I guess you can marry my daughter. Uh, and in the meantime, you're free to hang around and we'll continue to feed you and such like yeah agreed um just going back i think let's pick up some questions from my patrons uh mara lee i think uh i i tried to pick up you're asking about the major events leading up to the first age of middle earth i uh, i hope i've picked that one up already um ariel winchester you were asking for a brief summary of of the events uh in in the age first age which again i hopefully i managed to do try to wrap up a few of those things in the introduction uh and catherine Furseth, you were asking about the the, the lands uh which is why I showed the map. Um, question from uh, talking a little bit before the, the First Age, or the early years of the First Age before the sun, depending on which way you wish to interpret it. Uh, Sebastian uh, Schumala saying, um, we know that the First Age started when the sun first set its sail. Before that, light wasn't able to circle around Arda. The two trees of Valinor were a static source of light, 
coming only from the west direction. It's only logical their light couldn't reach the whole disk and could simply be blocked by the change in the terrain's height. So everything like deep valleys and mountain ranges should block it. Um, there are two massive mountain ranges, uh, Erith Lewin and Misty Mountains over in Middle Earth. Makes sense that Beleriand was therefore the main source of action because light wasn't blocked from there. Um, how then does vegetation, animals, and people survive to the east, the other side of the, the mountains? Um, I know that the simplest explanation is it's fantasy um, and magic, but is there more to it than that? Um, Lexi, why don't you kick off on this one? Is, is there? There is. Well, this is something that Tolkien struggled with himself. He was not insensible to the concerns that some of his biology was not syncing up well with just basic observational facts. So in the published Silmarillion, what we get is before we have the trees, we have the lamps. And the lamps are set at either point of the disk of the earth, and they're very, very high. They're like absurdly tall on the top of the highest, highest mountain. And they spread their light evenly without, you know, no, no such thing as night or cyclical sunrise, sunset kind of thing. It's just constant light beaming down on the whole earth. We have Iluin in the north and Ormal in the south. And we're... And, one of the reasons that they make these lamps is because Yavanna, who's the Vala, the Bali, I guess, of trees and plants and animals and growing things in nature, she's kind of our Earth Mother figure. She's quite eager to get on with growing plants, but she doesn't, the starlight is not enough to do that by. So they create these lights, and we hear that we get the first sort of primitive plants and Tolkien describes them as being like mosses and giant ferns and these huge massive conifers, which sounds like very prehistoric to me. And then Melkor being Melkor at this point, not Morgoth yet, but it, he will become Morgoth, very Morgoth-like action at any rate, crushes the lamps and spills the light and the light is kind of liquidy at this point. So it goes sloshing off all over everywhere and it burns some parts of the earth. But we get the sense that the plants that have begun to grow are still, they kind of lay dormant. Yavanna puts a sleep over them so they don't completely die. She kind of puts them into a winter. And this is one of her big, because like Ulmo, she doesn't forsake Middle Earth as quickly as the Valar do after this incident. Because the Valar look at all the destruction Melkor has wrought and they're like, we can't fix this. We need to move west and start over. So they kind of make, that's when they make the Blessed Realm of Amun has sort of this fenced perfect little garden that they know they can protect and they hope i think to eventually work out from there and start to fix what melkor has screwed up and yavanna's always concerned about her plants and her animals and she's always going to middle earth to check on them and see how they're doing so that's kind of how we get it started and then when the trees are see this is problematic the, the trees give light to Valinor. We don't know how big they are. They must have been pretty massive. They produce a sort of glowing liquid light that soaks into the ground and dissipates into the air. So I don't know if it could potentially spread that way. And then we also have uh, at the near the end of his life, some of his latest writings, Tolkien actually plays with the idea of scrapping the sun and the moon being the products of the trees after their attack by Ungoliant. And he has them start out. These are, this is from the very beginning of Earth, the very creation of Arda itself. He says there could be a sun and a moon, and then the trees would come after that. And that raises a whole bunch of problems for the later Legendarium. And he's trying to work those out. But one of his main reasons for doing that, I think, is not only it's more astro astronomically feasible, but it solves that problem of, well, then how are there so many trees and forest lands if. Morgoth has destroyed all the light. Yeah, I, I, this this is, I think I would agree, this is something that there's not an easy answer to. If you're interested in the sort of the nature stuff, there, very recently, just last month, there was a new book yes. uh, called The Nature of Middle Earth. I think you've, I think you've done a review video on, uh, actually. Um, I've not had a chance to read it yet, so I'm very much looking forward to that. But if you're interested in it, then that's that's, that's the new go-to place, I understand it, for understanding about the nature of things. I, I think the, the 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 way that I would frame this is that it wasn't that there was, well, three things. First of all, it's not that there was no light. The stars mm. were there. 
Um, and the stars um, seem to be quite bright stars. The elves woke to the sight of the stars and they seem to be able to see their way around because of the stars. So uh, we, we do have some light that is there. Uh, the second thing, I, I agree completely about the, the trees in Valinor. They're, the two trees... The light isn't it isn't just a, the way that we understand it. Light just goes in a straight line, uh, and if there's something blocking the way, then the light can't get through. It does seem to be a, a slightly more malleable concept of how light gets to places. Um, and then the third one, I think the most probably the most important is this. Um, you mentioned it, the sleep of Yavanna, which she puts all of when the the Valar sort of move away from Middle Earth. Um, she puts it all on this in this dormant state, um, which means that there aren't lots of bits of vegetation that need to uh, sunlight in order to grow. They they have enough with her power because she is she is the expression. Let's not forget the the Valar are not just like powerful beings. She is the expression of of, of Iluvatar in nature. And so she she has control over this, and she just sort of like changes the nature of them. And that's what the sleep uh, of Yavanna is that she changes the nature of of nature so that it doesn't need to grow in that same way. The the, the nature is different in Middle Earth during the years of the trees to how it is during the years of the sun. Um, so I think that it's it's. It's not an easy thing to answer, but I think those are the building blocks that we've been given by Tolkien. Yeah, he is. He does actually. It's nice because Tolkien it may not be a perfect answer, but he at least does reference and address the issues, the logical mm. issues that arise. Yeah, he does absolutely, and and he does it in this wonderfully. I mean, we would probably call it a sort of a quirky third person way of, of like he he always views this as as him being a scholar trying to understand what's going on in Middle Earth rather than this actually just being his uh, his own creation. Um, Kelly Johnson asking, was Ungoliant a conceptual entity? And I think that depends on what you consider a conceptual entity to be. But uh, Ungoliant uh, is clearly a one of a kind. Uh, in my view, um, clearly uh, is, is uh, I think, one of the original beings that sort of came down into uh, Arda right from the beginning um, and seems to obey different kinds of rules to, to most of the rest of what's in Middle Earth. So conceptual as in different, uh, I would absolutely agree. Conceptual as in just a concept, uh, I, I think Ungoliant was actually there. We we certainly we know of Ungoliant's descendants as well, for example. So uh, it was a, a real being. Uh, any thoughts on what is Ungoliant? Yeah, I tend to think that she was real. Um, her descended Shelob is certainly three-dimensional and concrete enough in The Lord of the Rings. So you would suspect that Ungoliant would likewise have some sort of physical reality. I wonder sometimes what Ungoliant is exactly meant to portray. She doesn't seem to be... She's. I think that one estimate is that she's some sort of fallen Maya, but she's a fallen Maya that can put the hurt on Morgoth, which is really impressive. Uh, Granted, she's just sucked the trees dry, so presumably that has increased her power. But there's something, there's something, something just ain't right about Ungoliant, and I think she's the personification of lack, which is really weird. That something, that that nothingness, that lack of existence and and hunger and emptiness could be personified. But that's what she seems to do because she takes, for example, she takes light and life and her prey, and she consumes them. She doesn't just consume them into herself. She consumes them and transforms them and gives them back, vomits forth unlight, which is very clearly distinguished from just a regular shadow or absence of light. It's something that's that has a sort of presence in and of itself. So Ungoliant, yeah, she scares me. I'm I'm still not exactly sure what she's supposed to be, but she scares me more than Morgoth does. Yes, and I think that it's that there is a, a power dynamic change between them. Morgoth clearly 
is the most powerful to start with. But then he loses a lot of his power because he kills the trees and then she sucks the life out of them. Seems to be what the the, the mix. It wasn't just her doing it. He's he like stabs them. Um, mm. Uh, and and that does seem to take a lot of energy out of him. So he's weakened at the same time that she's strengthened. Uh, and that point there, he can't deal with her. So yes, that is quite scary. But she is. I I tend to the same view as you that she is. Uh, she's a sort of a fallen Maya of some kind. Um, but more closer to the kind of the Tom Bombadil enigma end of mm-hmm. things rather than uh, I don't think she's like Tom Bombadil I've got different thoughts on that let's not go down now that's a complete rabbit hole we could go down um, but uh, more deliberately there Tolkien did not explain it and, and that was a deliberate thing on his part I think. Um, Cloaked Juan for picking up for Canadian Culture Corner saying uh, which great tale of the Silmarillion do you like best I think I had a question from one of my patrons asking something similar um, the three great tales were told in the Silmarillion, the three great tales, say, Baron Luthien, Fall of Gondolin, Children of Huin. I have to admit, for me, uh, of the three, I, I tend, I, Baron Luthien, I think, is the, not because I'm an old romantic, maybe it's partly because I'm an old romantic, but it's also a really good story. It's the, it's a sort of an, an against the odds story that is not just tragic. There are, there are terrible things that happen. But it's also got, you know, the the best dog in the entire history of the world. It's got um, a daring raid on, uh, on on the enemy stronghold. It's it's got um, uh, lots of just wonderful little bits uh, bits of sort of magical prose in there as well. Which one of the three would you, if you had to pick one, which would you go with? Uh, if we're talking just prose version, just great tales alone, it's Fall of Gondolin. It's I don't know what it is. Epic, epic white city falling into burning and ruin. It's got treachery. It's got those houses. I like. I'm a sucker for a good heraldry section. And at one point, Tolkien devotes several pages of describing the array of the elves as they're trying to defend their city. And I really like. I really like Tour. I really like Idril. Turgon, not my favorite, but Mygelin is fascinating. So. It's just, that's the one that I vibe hardest with, I guess. I really, I, I like them all. I do really like Baron and Luthien. I think the Lay of Lathian, the poetry version that Tolkien wrote, is some of his, some of the passages in there is some of his best stuff. And you can't overlook Huan. You you cannot. Um, you really uh, cannot. <laughs> so, I mean, I, and I think there, there are some, there, there are bits that I, I, I could probably carry on for a long time, but like mm. the Sauron the sort of squirming and turning into werewolves and vampires and goodness knows what else. I, it's fantastic. I love the little fun. I always I find it hilarious the fun twist at the end when uh, Thingol's trying to be like, uh, yeah, well you might have stolen a Silmaril, but technically the terms of our agreement was in your hand, and where is it? And then it's just like, ah, where is my hand? My hand's in the belly of the beast, and it's holding it in there, and it's just like. It's it's fantastic little um, little moments like that that work well for me. Um, Martin S. Would Tolkas uh, win a fight against all nine Nazgul solo? I believe he would. Could any of the other Valar solo um, all nine Nazgul? Um, I mean, I think for me the answer is yes. Definitely, Tolkas is is one of the the Valar. He is uh, he's an entity above and beyond. Whereas the um, uh, Sauron is. A, a Maya, and then the Nazgul are creations of him, so they're like an extra step down. And incidentally, I was just, I did a Glorfindel uh, mm. video recently. It's noticeable that Glorfindel, the, they they go they go away from him. And and yes, he's powerful, but he's nowhere near as powerful as uh, as Elrond. When he appears and shows his power, the, the Nazgul back away from him. Uh, so could Tulkas take all nine of them? Yes, definitely. And, and all all of the Valar, they have different powers, but um, yes, they're on a different power level. Would, would you disagree with that at all? Not at all. I think all of the Valar could take the Nazgul at any time. The question is, would they? And Tulkus definitely would, but I can see like Nienna just wanting to cry with them. <laughs> yeah. Are they capable of crying? I don't know. She would try. She would cry on their behalf. 
Um, yes. uh, Sanzero saying, how soon after our Farazon went to Aman, did the Valar move Aman away from the rest of Agda? Was it immediately or sometime after the waters came? Oh, well, so this is a question about the end of um, the Second Age, beginning of the Third Age. So this is um, moving forward. We can answer this one quickly. Um, uh, Numenor, our Farazon was the last king of Numenor. He was the guy who set sail to uh, to Valinor, saying, let us in. This is, this is our right to be here. You're not allowing us in. Um, and this was against the ban of the Valar. And as a result of that, he and his armada was destroyed. Numenor was uh, was destroyed. And Aman, the great continent of Valinor's there, that was taken away, not just uh, before they sort of moved away from Middle-earth, but now it's literally just taken away onto a different plane. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, I don't know whether, Alexa, you know off the top of your head the exact timings, but this was, the, um, it, it's in that short period straight afterwards. Yeah, I don't know if we get a date specifically, but uh, Amon was always separated from Middle Earth by a significant body of water, later physical barriers and enchantment barriers because they couldn't just have the Noldor coming back. After all, they're very naughty. Uh, <laughs> and what we're talking about, I don't even know if I forget if it says that this is the Valar who do this. Because when Numenor sinks, the implication is that the world has been forever changed from without by basically divine intervention this is an act of will from Eru himself the sort of monotheistic god that sits outside of all this and is keeping it all running and I think it's his changing of the world to defend Amun by taking it basically off of what we consider our primary plane of reality off of the physical plane and bending the world, this is why we talk about, or Tolkien references, the bent world, all the paths are bent, and you need to find the straight road back. The straight road refers to, at least in some conceptions of the Legendarium, a time when the earth was literally flat and you could just sail straight horizontally forever and make it to Valinor eventually. Now that's no longer possible. We live in a world that's round. Valinor is somehow still inhabiting the flat world dimension and I, I think that it, it was a consequence of removing Valinor from the physical world that led to the fall of Numenor, that created such a great upheaval that Numenor sank into the sea. I think. Yes. I don't, don't cite me in your scholarly I, papers, I, I, people. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. Uh, but no, I think that I think that's entirely fair. This, this was very much, this is from Eru uh, Iluvatar, but I think that the... Um, it's always slightly muddy uh, where where the like mm. because the, the the Valar are expressions of him and his creativity, uh, and so yes, they're there sort of independently doing their things. But there are some times when it's sort of hinted that this is a rural avatar doing things direct, but it's never explicitly said. I think this is one of those th times when yeah, he did it. Uh, and he shifted things around. This so, is so the exact timing of wh whether that happened immediately or whether that was over the you know, over the course of a couple of years. Or yeah, something. how long did I it take? Think, it's hard to say. Tolkien tells us. Um, Caius Ballerina, does Valinor have the same flora and fauna as Middle Earth? Uh, this sounds the perfect question for somebody who's just read the nature of Middle Earth. Um, I mean, the short answer obviously is they still have trees and grass and stuff like that. It, is there anything in there about the, the, the sort you know, of the flora and fauna? There is a lot in about Numenor's flora and fauna. It gets very detailed down to the level of, well, they had duck-like poultry, but they had to import the chicken-like poultry many years later on during their expansion. It, like, very granular. Um, there are bears, for example, but there are no wolves. So which I'm like, really? You, they, they are only large predator in Numenor and it's bears and they all dance. Thank you, Tolkien. Um, but as, <laughs> as far as Valinor goes, I think this may be from Book of Lost Tales. I think there's a reference to the idea that it's kind of a Noah's Ark 
every animal that exists, some version of it exists in Valinor in its sort of perfected form. It's this garden where the, the Valar are cultivating a perfect version of everything that exists. They're sort of unmarred, unaffected by Morgoth ideal of what the earth could be. And the only, like, so specifically we know that Huan is a hound out of Valinor. He's one of Orome's hounds. So we know there's hounds. We know that they hunt. So presumably there's prey animals. There's, I mean, there may be little baby spiders running around in the far north. Um, and there's Nehar and uh, Rahalor. So, so Nehar's possibly a, a Maya in disguise, but he's he's Orome's horse. But Rahalor is from... Valinor. He's, he's from that line. So there's horses in Valinor as well. So we know there's dogs, we know there's horses, and I believe at least in one version there's some line that says there's one of one of everything in Valinor in its sort of exalted state. But I don't know if there's an ecology question there. Yeah, I don't know if the, the tigers and the bunny rabbits are all running around together. I, I can't answer that. And as, as far as I know, nature of Middle-earth when it's talking about the first stage in Valinor, it's it's all mathematical tables of elven gestation periods. So, <laughs> I mean, I I think I think yes, it's uh, the all the indications we have is that it's the same kind of natural life. If you've got a hunt, if they do hunting, then that implies that not only do you have uh, prey, but you also have animals that are there who naturally will be uh, uh, hunting other animals. Um, there's also an Ungoliant hiding off uh, in in the on that continent. Let's not forget um, mm -hmm. that's where she decided. You know, why not hide out just where they're not expecting me to be? Um, and I, th I think the other thing to say is that the light. We talked about the light a moment ago, but the light from the trees is not just. It's not just light. It's not just brightness. This is nourishing. This is holy. This is um, uh, enriching light which allows people to be the best version of who they are and it allows everything to be the best version of what it is. Uh, so that, I, I, I like the idea you're talking about, like, and I don't think you use these exact words, but like this platonic ideal of, of mm. all the different types of animals. And that certainly is the feel that we get in terms of um, uh, the, the, what it, the experience of it is like. And there's no reason to think that that is not true for the, nature flora and fauna uh, and talking of flora and fauna lyle hammock again thank you very much lyle saying what is your opinion on trees in the legendarium they are a through line in the entire story what do you think tolkien is saying what i think tolkien is saying is that he loves trees <laughs> it's my short answer on that one he was very clear he did he's he writes about trees particular trees that he he loved uh, he talked about a tree. He wrote about a tree in C.S. Lewis's garden. He wrote about a tree uh, that he could see from his bedroom window as he grew up. He wrote about, he, he loved trees and he wrote about them a lot. And I think this is just, they were for him the sort of the representation of goodness in the natural world. So um, I think, I think personally it's as simple as that. But is there, is there an, other, an added layer that you, you think of there or are you just with the, he, he was a tree guy? He's a tree guy. Um, there's he wrote a short story, Leaf by Niggle, where he's imagining creative expression as a tree that grows and it sort of fractally becomes more complicated than the creator can keep up with, and it's this living thing. So it's it's a very important metaphor for him, I think, in terms of an expression of what it means to be a creator, especially a creator of a whole universe where you're trying to get into the linguistics of it and the metaphysics of it and the flora and the fauna and so on and so forth, the geography. And we know that so much of it he left unfinished. So I think the idea that a tree grows and branches and kind of goes off into infinity might have some importance for him. I also want to point out that for a guy who loves trees, and he does love trees, and he talks a lot about trees, a lot of his trees are quite sinister and can can easily be corrupted, it seems. The Old Forest is an example of this. We have Old Man Willow. We have even the Ents are not – they're very impartial. They say that famous nobody – I'm not on anybody's side because nobody is entirely on my side. So he does love trees. 
I don't think he considers them necessarily always benign. I think just like anything in Middle Earth, there is a good way to be a tree and a bad way to be a tree. And the bad trees are very terrifying. So he has mad respect for even fallen trees or trees with a canker at their heart. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and trees on he, he does idealize trees in a way. But, yeah, absolutely. He does have um, I, th I think he very much wants us to um, respect them as representations pay of nature and pay attention to them. I think that's yeah. one of his big themes is you walk along and you see a tree that you've seen hundreds of times. Well, you know, what do you know about that tree? Really? Did you ever stop to notice it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Martin S. Uh, how do you think Finarfin and Erwin greeted their daughter Galadriel during their reunion in, in Amman after all the millennia in the early fourth age? Okay, we're moving on to the fourth age now. Um, oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, the, so Galadriel, uh, let's do a quick potted history of Galadriel here. So Galadriel um, was one of the Noldor who came across with Feanor. She was. She did not like Feanor, though, not at all. She did not agree with him. However, Tolkien is very clear that she deliberately did want to go to Middle Earth. It wasn't just uh, she was following out of duty. She wanted to go because she wanted to rule lands over there, and a lot of what he wanted, Feanor, also was within her. That fire burned within her as well, and so her her kind of long, very long story arc is actually this changing from this very proud person who has quite literally sort of a, a desire to rule, a lust for power, which in Tolkien's world is not a good thing, to a, a point where at the in the Lord of the Rings she can be offered great power with the One Ring and turn it down. And that's the point where finally she can return back home because actually she's reached a point of wisdom. That's her sort of character up there. So in terms of how she would be greeted when she comes back, I, we're not told huge amounts about what she was like over in Belenor, but what we are told seems to imply that she was uh, quite celebrated, that she was renowned she was very capable uh, and she also had great ambition so i think that when she comes back that people will see that she's actually become all that she she could have been and has gained wisdom along the way so i think that that would be a very um a very good and happy uh, homecoming for her and, and any thoughts for you um two thoughts so the first is that we have to remember she's coming back home to her parents Finarfin who's the high king of the Noldor and Amun he's the only really high king of the Noldor left at this point good on you Finarfin <laughs> and then his, her mother Arwen who's Teleran so that's going to be interesting but also we know that her brother Finrod who dies in the first age has also been reincarnated and is walking around with Finarfin under the trees it says he's he's there also He's reincarnated very quickly because of his great deeds of mercy and compassion, helping Baron out and doing other good things as well. So she gets to see her big brother again, too. And I think Finrod and Galadriel have both, because Finrod was in the same boat. He also, oh, sorry, oh, not, not in not the in same the boat. <laughs> boat. Um, yeah. uh, very, very definitely not in a boat. He was on the same ice flow as Galadriel, deciding to go to Middle Earth having just witnessed the slaughter of his kin at the hands of his own cousins and half cousins, but deciding, well, we're going to go anyway because we want to make something of ourselves out of the shadow of the Valar. And they go to middle earth and Finrod very quickly, Galadriel rather slowly realized that this is not going to work out the way they had hoped and that they need to sober up and get their lives in order and learn some humility so they've both been through very similar journeys in that regard, and I think they're going to really have a lot to talk about. Uh, I also think Finrod is going to be absolutely delighted with hobbits. 
I think he's just going to lose his mind at the idea that there are, oh, wait, men have continued to evolve and now there's a tiny version of them and they make tea and they want to talk about elven linguistics. I think he's just going to fanboy all over Bilbo and Frodo, which they deserve it. So that makes me very happy. And there's also the point that um, there is a slim possibility that Finarfin, when he returned for the War of Wrath, did meet Galadriel in Middle-earth and she said that she wasn't coming back with him. Jenny Dolphin is a great Tolkien fan artist, and she kind of imagines what that scene might be like. She painted it in coffee, like actually using coffee as the medium. Okay. Um, so that's, yeah, go check go check her out and see if you can find that on her website. Um, that's a really interesting idea to me, the idea that this might not be the first meeting of Galadriel and Finarfin since the flight of the Noldor that potentially Galadriel might have been, you know, might have had the opportunity at the end of the first age to go back as she, in some versions she did, she was extended that grace as were all the surviving Noldor to, okay, you can say you're sorry now and come back. And she said, no, not ready yet. Still not sorry. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. And went east with Celeborn. So I think her father might have had to deal yeah. with a little bit of <laughs> abandonment issues there. And, and I mean, this is a fascinating thing about Galadriel because uh, Tolkien does change his mind. But in, in, in fact, if you read in uh, Book of Unfinished Tales, Christopher Tolkien, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically says, out of all of the bits of my father's writings, this is the hard Galadriel and Celeborn and what they were doing in the, like the, the, the first, second age is the hardest to actually pin down what he, what he wanted. Um, but uh, she definitely, uh, or the Noldor, as you say, they were they were forgiven. They were said that you, they can come back. Either the, uh, the the Valor said, "Not you, Galadriel," or she specifically said, "No, I don't want to." In which case, I said, "In that case, you're still banned." Um, that's what kind of works for me. But she deliberately wanted to stay in Middle Earth. Uh, you're right. This is um, uh, and it's it's almost as if her time was not yet done she knew that she she had not yet achieved the thing that she wanted to do which was rule and i think that her wisdom could not come into its fullness until she'd actually achieved that thing that ambition that she had and realized probably actually this isn't everything that i desire and need yes i can do this but this isn't it's not just about uh, power grabbing but as we're on Galadriel, I have a question from one of my patrons, uh, Matthew Hawkins, uh, saying a bit off the first age topic. Uh, we're, we're going a bit off the first age topic, so uh, that's OK. Um, however, I recently listened to Andy Serkis's narrated version of The Fellowship of the Ring, which I thoroughly recommend. I've, I've not listened to it myself, but I've had lots of people recommend it, uh, it to me. Uh, apparently, uh, Andy Serkis does an excellent job. Um, in the section of the book, when the Fellowship are leaving Lothlorien, Galadriel is giving them farewell presents. Had Galadriel already read Gimli's mind to find out what gift he really desired of her, hence asking him the question, what would a dwarf ask of an elf? Was it to see if he would answer her honestly? Um, I've, got, I've got a very clear idea in my mind here what was what was going on. Uh, this does link back, I think, to who she was before. We've already had one callback with with Gladriel, as I say, this having this lust for power and then uh, refusing to take power. She's gained the wisdom. There, we Gimli's there, um, wanting the hair from Gladriel, and somebody else also in the past wanted a hair from Gladriel, and that was Feanor. Uh, and she said no, but here she gives give me the hair. Um, what's your what's your take on what was going on here? There's clearly layers happening here. Tolkien's doing callbacks. He's he's also thinking about the the elf dwarf uh, kind of relationship as well. What do you think is going on in that scene situation? So. I assume that Gimli is not clued into the whole fan art asks Galadriel for her hair situation. I think this, I had to do a lot of thinking about this scene um, when I, I did a video on Gimli months ago, trying to, 
defend him against the popular conception of him as just being this hot-headed comic relief character, this scene is really delicately judged because we have the... First of all, it's a public scene. It's taking place with all of the other elves looking on. We've already had an encounter between Celeborn and Gimli where Celeborn has been rather salty, justifiably so in my opinion, about the dwarves and their doings and the fact that it always seems to mess things up for the elves. And Gimli also justified defending himself, saying he doesn't really say anything, he really can't, because he's surrounded by a bunch of armed elves. Um, but Gimli kind of be taking umbrage to that and then Galadriel intervening and saying, don't be like that, Celeborn, come on, he's had a rough time. And Gimli kind of becomes, in this very chivalric courtly love kind of way becomes smitten with Galadriel and he becomes in his heart I think it's that moment that he becomes her champion so now comes this moment at the end where they're departing and Galadriel's giving gifts in a very ceremonial way and she gives Aragorn a very significant gift and Frodo's going to get his file and everyone else is going to get gifts that are worthy of them and show their friendship with the elves of Lorien and then she comes to Gimli and she says what is it that a dwarf would ask of an elf? Which is a really well-worded because in the past there have been troubles where dwarves have asked for too much from the elves in payment, at least according to the elves, and the elves have said that's too much and bloodshed has ensued. So she says, what would a dwarf ask of the elves? And Gimli, who has, I, you gotta know that he's been expecting this question. He says, nothing. I don't want anything from you. Your your friendship and beauty is enough, yada yada. I would ask nothing of you. Great. Good job, Gimli. You've you've seen that coming and you've answered it well. Then Galadriel says, Well, no, I name I bid you name what it is that you would have of me. Surely there must be something. Name it, I bid you. So now he's in a bind because she's just told him, again in front of everyone, to name something that she can give him. So she's ordered him to do this, basically. So he can't continue to just politely refuse. So he's got to think quick and come up with something. And I I think it's kind of a spur of the moment thing for him where, so I don't think that she looked into his mind and saw necessary. I think she saw that she could trust him enough to ask this question, but I don't think she knew that, oh, he's going to ask me for my hair. So I think what he comes up with is, you know, a lock of your hair because... This is a very sentimental item. It's something that she alone can give him because no one else is going to give him her hair unless someone sneaks up behind her, which would be horrifying, um, and like cuts off one of her braids to give to Gimli. Like, that is not what he's going for here. So it's a sentimental gift. It's something that he can remember her by. It's something that only she can give to him. It's not worth anything in and of itself. I mean, what are you going to do with hair? It's not the same thing as gold or a mighty weapon. You can really just only, like Gimli says, I will cherish it. I'll hold it forever as a memory of you and of your land. So it's really well judged because it shows that Gimli values the same things as the elves do. He values beauty. He values light. Um, obviously, this request is a lot more significant than Gimli even realizes because... This is the hair that Galadriel denied to Feanor, and here she is trusting a dwarf with three times as much as Feanor wanted. He just Feanor just was begging a single strand there at the end, and Galadriel goes out of her way to give Gimli three. One for each time that Feanor asks her. It's all very symbolic. So, I, I don't... Long story short, no, I don't think she knew that he was specifically going to ask for hair. I think she even, like, laughs when he says it, because she's like, that was not what I was expecting, but it's perfect. And then she goes out of her way to make a big show of publicly giving him and trusting him with her hair because she's saying, look, they value what we value. The dwarves and the elves were both on the side of the light, ultimately. So I think it's a very, like, political moment as much as it's also a very heartfelt one. Sorry, I, I think a lot about Gimli. <laughs> I, I have <laughs> as, a lot as of you thoughts. I, I, I am, I'm firmly of the camp that he was the character who was worst done by him. Um, I, I think that he's, he's he's a fantastic character, and he was just turned into comic relief. But um, on th on this particular instance, I I would agree with everything you said. I, I think you, you articulated it really well. Um, I I would only add one nuance, um, which is that she um, she asked him what you know what do you want me to. What, what do you want to ask me as, as a gift? And he says, I'm not going to ask you for anything. And then she says, what do you desire? And 
he just says what he does. He never asks her for it. Yes, he never asks and her. He says, it's... since you, I don't ask you for it, but you, you yeah. told me to name what I want. So I've named it. You don't have to do yeah. anything about it. And that, I think, is the the shift across from where we had with Feanor. Feanor asked her for it, her hair, and she said no. Gimli does not. He he recognized he's not going to lie. He does want it, but <laughs> he's not going to ask for it. And that, I think, is what prompts her to give him the hair. And as you say, the, Feanor asks three times and doesn't get it, and Gimli does not ask at all and gets three. So it's almost like she's kind of uh, balancing out what was there, but this is the right way of doing it because he did not ask. And that is why he's given it. Um, so, yeah, I agree. It's a beautiful little um, moment. Um, Cloaked Juan, thank you very much, saying sending some funds for the other goodest uh, boys treat and toy fund, virtual head pats for Dan the dog. Uh, I will I will do that. He's, he's gone up to bed. Um, uh, but uh, in the morning, I will give him a little uh, head pat. Um, uh, let's go to a question from uh, Lyle Hammock again. Thank you very much. You're being very generous today, Lyle. Um, uh, Echelion of the Fountain, I think this is Echthelion, I think, uh, saying, uh, sorry for the spelling, uh, had the most um, metal death head butting Gothmog Lord of the Balrogs to death as he died. Um, yeah, do you want to uh, do you want to tell us about Echthelion? So, I mean, that really says it all has a metal death. So <laughs> Echthelion is, again, it's been a while since I, I read this scene specifically, but Echthelion is Lord of the Fountain. He's fighting. At this point, they're really just trying to contain the damage because Mygleen has opened the gates. There's been this surprise assault. So really, um, the soldiers of Gondolin such that they are just trying to hold back the tides of Balrogs and Orcs and Fire Drakes and all kinds of nasties that are just burning their city as they go. And Echthelion encounters Gothmog in the court of the fountain, and they're wrestling and fighting. Um, and it's interesting, in the fall of Gondolin, this was written during a time when Balrogs were not as big of a deal as they later became, so there's just tons of them running all over. I think Glorfindel's mentioned to have killed like seven or eight on, just on his way out. So they're they're a little bit less of the big boss that they will later become when Tolkien decides that, well, actually they're a pretty big deal and there were never that many of them to begin with. In in this early version of the Fall of Gondolin where we get Ecthelion's death, they're, they're kind of everywhere. But Gothmog's the boss. He's a big deal. He's one of the party that killed Feanor, so, you know, he's got to be important. And he and Ecthelion are wrestling... Ecthelion has a spiked helmet. He slams his helmet into Gothmog's chest, which would, you know, be a, a pretty significant blow. I don't know if it would be enough to kill a Balrog because they're kind of magical, but it hurts him good and they fall back into the fountain together and Ecthelion's armor is so heavy that he sinks and drowns in his own fountain. And it's just one of those, like, dying in your own city or tower because of your own work that Tolkien loves to throw in there and it's just it's very painful and very metal and just this is why we love Ecthelion well yeah, I absolutely. love Ecthelion I don't know if well, you, maybe, maybe you don't love Ecthelion the way I do uh, maybe not the way you do <laughs> uh, the, I think um, I, I'm i a big fan of uh, Glorfindel or uh, Glorfindel as, as other people seem to pronounce him I don't know um, uh, I, 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 I'm a big fanboy of him uh, I have to say but the two of them are ways they they seem to operate as a duo quite a lot. They do. Um, uh, Lyle Hammock, thank you again. Again, a very generous super, uh, super chat saying, uh, I remember the conversation between Galadriel and uh, Calimbrimbor, or Calimbrimbor, uh, when she says, basically, what have I done that I must return and beg supplication? I have done nothing wrong. Um, uh, yes. Uh, also, what is the true history of the Elisar stone? I always find it very murky. Um Yes, yeah, so the Elisar stone is it is very murky because it's uh, the well. First of all, there are two possible stones uh, that you could be talking about, uh, and they kind of get mixed up. They both got the same name, and then also Tolkien writes a kind of an alternative history for one of them as well. So that's that's where it is. Um, I'll I'll start, and then Lexi, if you want to pick up um, uh, at some point, there's so the. This is the stone that was given to uh, that Galadriel gave to 
Aragorn. I think it was, I think it was the gift, wasn't it, that um, she gave him uh, at the end. Um, and uh, the 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 first one, as I say, there were two. The first one was made in Gondolin, um, and uh, we don't know exactly who made it there. Um, and then, but it was saved from uh, from Gondolin and was carried across when Erendil went across to uh, to a man to Valinor to try and um, get the help of Valinor. He took that across with him. Then uh, Celebrimbor made another one. He may have made that first one. We don't know, but he made another one, um, which he gave to her, and she then kept hold of it for a long time before giving it on to Aragorn. There was a third version where uh, this stone came back, and I think I think the, the, the Astari brought it back, um, but it gets a bit murky. One of the things, I, I say this, I think, on almost, almost all of these uh, Lord of the Rings live streams, is that we often view, as, as we should, as, as Tolkien's world as being the most wonderfully detailed and complete uh, fantasy world and vision ever, which I would argue, yes, it is. But this was his life's work, and he changed his mind a lot. Um, and so when you start digging into the weeds of all of this, you'll find uh, that he's got lots of different versions of things going on, and Christopher Tolkien discovered them and had published them, and so we then get a lot more confusion going on. Um, but uh, is there anything you want to add on the sort of the history there of the the Elfstone LSR? Um, no, I think reiterating that it, there is oftentimes with Tolkien knowing which version is the one that he would have had in mind at any given moment or which would have been his final version is o almost impossible, especially when it comes to things found in um, unfinished tales. Chris Tolkien says, like you said, with specifically referring to Galadriel and Celeborn, but it really refers to the whole thing. This is some of the most complicated stuff. It's things that he rewrote. It's His manuscripts are just in complete disarray. One of my favorite parts about reading Nature of Middle-Earth was just the little header on each chapter of, this was written on four separate pieces of paper and the back of one food receipt from Merton College, dated around 1954. <laughs> yes. So it's like, you know, in ballpoint pen, scratched out multiple times, the handwriting becomes almost illegible. It's like, this is classic Tolkien. His notes were just a complete nightmare. So... The other thing about the LSR that I like is that in one version, Galadriel commissions it from Celebrimbor. It, part of that conversation where she's like, well, why shouldn't I stay in Middle-earth? And why shouldn't I want it to be as nice as Valinor? Like, why not try? What's the harm in trying? What's so wrong about that? And the idea behind the LSR is when you look through it, you kind of see the world as it ought to be. And that's kind of a way that it brings healing so we go back to that idea of kind of referenced earlier with the light of the trees. It's it's how you're shining light on things that's potentially giving them more than natural nourishment or uh, regenerative ability. So the Elsar is interesting. It's it's kind of obviously in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien talks about it as if it's very important. He, we hear more references to the LSR and to the green stone than we do to, I think, the Silmaril even, but it's unclear, it's very unclear what its history would have ultimately looked like. Yes, it's probably the, of, of the things which Aragorn has to kind of prove his... Uh, birthright and his status and all the rest of it it's probably the one of the more murky ones we all understand hey this is the sword which which Isildur held we get we understand that and then we get all of the there's that there's a whole of a load of the ring of barra here and things like that we understand the history this one's the one where it's like uh okay so this is clearly important and it's clearly pretty but it's not a hundred percent sure exactly where this sort of this fits in, uh, partly because uh, Tolkien has, has got a few different uh, versions of what's going on with this. Um, uh, we've got a question about uh, elves, so I shall throw this one happily over to you. Uh, what was the age difference? We may not know this. What was the age difference with the sons of Feanor? This is Brig2630 uh, and his brother's children. I feel like there should have been more grandkids of Feanor than uh, Celebrimbor. 
So what's the what's the deal here with the, the family of Feanor ages? Okay, so I'm so happy that this question came through because this is a <laughs> chance for me to talk about the messed up family tree of the house of Finway and all of his descendants, which are not that many as maybe they should be, and there's a reason for that. So we know that Feanor is the son of Finway and his first wife, Muriel. Muriel puts forth so much of her energy in having Feanor that she actually, her soul leaves her body and refuses to return, and so she dies in a way that no other elf has really managed to do that we know of since. And she refuses to return to life, as is typical for an elf if nothing else is wrong with them and they haven't done anything particularly bad. The general life cycle is that they would return, but she refuses to do that. She's probably having an idea of what's about to come. She's like, I'm done. Um, so Finway petitions to be allowed to remarry, and eventually he does, and he takes a second wife, Indus of the Vanyar, and they're, they have a bunch of children. We only... In the Silmarillion, we really only get the sons, but they have a couple daughters in there as well. So uh, the sons of Finway and Indus are Fingolfin and Finarfin. And their names are weird, and there's a reason for that, but I won't get into it because I'm not going to get into Quenya right now. Um, so we also, at least we used to know before Nature of Middle-Earth came out and threw like 10 different versions of it at us, we also know that Elves typically, at least, so going off of Morgoth's ring, they tend to marry between 50 and 100 years, as it were. Um, and then there's some spacing between each of their children. Elves are immortal. Valian years are not the same as solar years. So it all gets very complicated very quickly. But given that there was a significant lapse of time between Finway's first wife dying and him finally petitioning well can i at least have a second wife if my first wife refuses to return to me this isn't really i didn't really sign up for this i was hoping to have like a big family and everything uh and we know that fanor was not happy about this so we presume that he was at least old enough to know what was going on we also know that fanor married early so my belief is that it makes the most sense for the sons of Feanor, specifically the older sons of Feanor, he has seven sons, which is the most of any elf recorded. Um, the oldest sons of Feanor, I think, were probably about the same age, if not older than their uncles. Um, as far as the Feanorians go, we know that for we we are know that Maglor is supposed to have been married. We don't know to who. I think Caranthir is supposed to have been married, and we know Cruifin was married, and. Again, multiple versions of Celebrimbor's history and parentage and everything, but the one that seems most settled in Lord of the Rings is that he's Curufin's son. And, of course, we don't know the names of any of their wives because they presumably didn't come to Beleriand and didn't really do anything, so they're kind of unfortunately left out of the history. One can only imagine that the kind of women to take on the viper's nest of the House of Finway must have been quite spectacular in their own right. Um, so the rest of the... Feanorian sons presumably are unmarried, so that would be Mithros the eldest, uh, who has enough on his hands with his brothers and his cousins. I can totally understand why he didn't want to like start his own family on top of that. Um, and then we have Kelegorm, who famously tries to marry himself off to Luthien, and that doesn't go well. And we have the two youngest twins, Amrod and Amras. So of the seven Feanorians, we know that really only three were probably married, and we don't know of any of them having any other children except for Kurufin, who has the one. And I think this is thematically important, because Feanor is a great creator. He's a the greatest craftsman of the Noldor. He's the greatest in mind, body, and spirit of any elf that's ever lived. Tolkien really wanted us to appreciate how powerful and wonderful Feanor was, and that just makes his fall all the more painful, knowing what he could have been, the amount of potential he had. So he has enormous creative potential. He has the highest number of children of any elf. And then his legacy becomes down to this one. The only one that survives is Celebrimbor. And what does Celebrimbor do? He immediately, well, not immediately, but very quickly becomes corrupted by Sauron. And he ends horribly as well. So I think there's this idea that the unrestrained creativity and pride of Feanor ultimately kind of ends his line prematurely. It starts out really impressive, but because of his own misdeeds, all of that creative potential is squandered and kind of meets a dead end. So, sorry. Again, thoughts about the Finwians. I could go on. 
I mean, th- these are good thoughts, uh, and this is why we have you on. This is excellent. Uh, I, I do, I do really like the echo that Tolkien sets up between Feanor, who was mm. uh, corrupted by Morgoth. That wasn't just Morgoth, but there was definitely that there, and created the Silmarils. Uh, and then you you get uh, Celebrimbor, who was uh, corrupted or certainly misled by Sauron and created the rings. And this th- this is. Uh, it's it's almost like the baby version. You get the the massive thing going on uh, with Feanor and Morgoth, and then you get Morgoth's lieutenant, and you get uh, um, Feanor's uh, grandkid, and the, it's 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 the same feel that's going on there. That you can make lots of links between how Tolkien uses the, the Silmarils and and the the One Ring as well. So. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, Lyle Hammock saying, uh, Lexi, I am unfriending you for your support of Morgoth. Um, this is entirely <laughs> understandable. Uh, we had this very same conversation with when Helen the Clueless Fangirl was on. Um, uh, but you did also ask over on Patreon, and this is a moment, actually, I do it every time. Uh, patrons, thank you. Uh, this I frame my live streams around questions from my patrons because it's your support that allows me to keep doing this. So thank you very much. If you do wish to support this channel, then the best way to do that is through Patreon. There is a link down in the description, or if you're watching live, uh, wherever your chat box is. Uh, But let's go to a question from Lyle. Um, This is a question about human migration to Beleriand. Do we know why humans moved west? Uh, and what do we know of the culture they brought with them and how that mixed with the elves and how that changed both groups, if at all? Um, I was just reading about Heleth. Can we get some love for this amazing leader? I find her fascinating as she didn't bow to the elves and told them to pound sand. Um, Okay, so uh, if I start off on the the humans bit here, and then I'm I'm sure you've got things to say about Heleth. I think you you name-checked her earlier, actually, as one of your favourite characters. Um, in terms of humanity, humanity arrived further to the east of, of what we have in that map that I showed a bit earlier. And then it's worth saying most did not migrate west. Most stayed off in the east. Um, and as a complete aside, uh, Mara Lee, I know you also did a question asking about the, what, what was up with the wizards in the first age. And the short answer is... Uh, nothing. They were still there over in um, uh, Valinor, there as as Maiar. Um, but by the second age, we're getting the blue wizards who are heading off to the east because this is where humanity has sprouted and grown and stayed. So that's we just concentrate on the little bit that we're looking at. But really, the bigger story for humanity is happening off screen elsewhere. So the 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 groups that do head west, the they head west, we're told, uh, following the light, which is basically following the sun, um, as far as we can tell. But also, there is this kind of, again, an echo of the elves heading west, heading towards Valinor. They, they're children of Iluvatar as well. Uh, the Valar seem to not care huge amounts about them, but they definitely are children of Iluvatar as well. And so following that kind of migratory move west is natural to them. Um, and one of the, the characters, we get huge amounts of these fantastic human characters. One of them is, is Haleth, who was uh, a leader uh, and uh, did not, as you say, uh, lie a bow before the elves because the big issue came with the fact that the elves had been around for thousands of years, they'd set up their con- they'd set up their kingdoms, they carved up uh, Middle Earth in between them, and then humans come along. They knew that you know these are the second lot of the children of Levitar, the Valar knew that they were coming, but where are they going to be? What are they going to do? Uh, they they try and settle down, and the elves say, "Well, this is my land. You, you're gonna you're gonna pay fealty to me." Some say yes, some say no, uh, which is my cue to sort of lead into you telling us about Haleth, who said no. Yes, so like you said, I, it's really worth remembering when we're talking about the three houses of the Adain, the good, 
quote, good humans who support the elves and who oppose Morgoth and show up in Beleriand. That's a tiny, tiny fraction of humanity as a whole. There's innumerable tribes either to the east or kind of floating around who are either indifferent to this great war or they're actively working for Morgoth. So there's three houses. The house of Hador gets involved with um, mostly Fingolf and Fingon up north. The house of Beor... I forget, I know that's not originally uh, their leader's name, but they become known for their leader, Beor, who pledges his fealty to Finrod, and that's this is the line that Bar uh, Baron eventually comes from. This is the bond between Finrod and Barahir, who gets him out of a tight spot that eventually uh, leads Finrod to his unfortunate, untimely death, trying to help his buddy's kid out, get him, get him a girl via Silmaril. So those are the two houses that really get closely tied to a particular elven lord and work for them much as their elven soldiers and vassals do. And then we get the folk of Haleth, who, let's see, her father is conveniently named Haldad, and then I believe her brother is Halmir? So... Hal Haleth is not originally the leader of her people. The The folk of Haldad are more independent. They're kind of the Nandor of, or the Sylvan Elves of Theodain. They don't swear allegiance to a particular elven lord. They don't really even have a strong human leadership themselves. They're just a loose confederation of independent homesteads. And they're living in Caranthir's land kind of because he isn't really that interested in them. He's a proud Feanorian. He's not terribly interested in humans. He's not hostile to them necessarily. He just doesn't really care. He's overlooked them for a long time. So he's let them settle in part of his undeveloped lands. And they're living there and they get attacked by orcs. And Haleth's father rallies all the people together, creates a defensible area. He dies. Uh, Haleth's brother dies going out to try to recover his body before the orcs can desecrate it, um, probably eat it. I can't imagine it would have been a very good time. And so Haleth, who, again, it's not like her father was king or anything. He was just sort of the one that stepped up. Um, Haleth finds herself in the position of having to hold her people together and maintain this ad hoc siege against the orcs, which she does for a week after they've run out of food. So they've run out of food, they're besieged, people are starting to throw themselves in the river rather than face the fact that the orcs are eventually going to overpower them, and you really don't want to be overpowered by orcs, especially in the first stage. It does not end well for people. So the river is looking like a, a much better option. So the orcs are literally beating down her gates, and who comes riding in but... Caranthir with his men because, you know, there's orcs in his land and he can't tolerate that, at least not after the first couple weeks. So he rides in, rides to their aid, wipes out the orcs, and he is astonished. He's like, wow, you guys really came through. I was not expecting to see this. You're very valiant. I am amazed. I overlooked you. He said, do you guys want to be my vassals? I'll give you a really choice piece of land and you can live here and, you know, I'll kind of protect you and be your lord and do all my lordly duties for you. And you guys in turn will be under my protection but also, you know, under my rule. And, uh, yeah, Halith says no. <laughs> she she looks at him and she says, yeah, that's essentially, I forget exactly how she says it's much more, much more spicy than what I'm about to say, but she says, that's nice and everything, but we're not going to hang around. We don't want to be your vassals, and we think it's probably better if we just leave. So, you know, Caranthia has given them this very generous offer, and she tells them, nah, thanks, we don't need that, and she takes her people, and they become known from then on as the people of Haleth, because she becomes this very distinguished leader. Later, she settles in an area near Doriath, just outside the borders of Doriath, and Thingol sends them a lovely message that says, you're perfectly welcome to stay here, just don't let any orcs come through. And she sends him back a message that says, where are Hal Haldad, my father, and Helmir, my brother, if the king of Doriath thinks that I'm basically, if I'm in any way going to be friendly to orcs after what I've seen and what I've been through, then I just don't understand elves at all. She says the ways of elves are indeed strange to men, if that's what you think. So she, leader of a very small people, not can't imagine that she's terribly wealthy or educated by the standards of the Noldor and the Sindar of the day. 
just telling these powerful lords left and right to just just leave her alone i could i could say some other words but i want to keep this at least a pg rated stream um (laughs) she she is so violently unimpressed by them just very hard to hard to phase haleth so that's yes like like the man the the man asking the question said i forgot exactly who but thank you because yes haleth just tells them to pound sand she doesn't need them she doesn't need their protection she doesn't want what they're selling which is not great because the other tribes of the adine don't end well and just goes off and does her own thing and it's it's quite admirable yeah and it is and it's also i think it's it's a standing up for the rights of humanity to be equally owners of middle earth i i which and i don't think that halith would have thought about it in these grand terms but uh, the it's always this kind of like the, the the elves go yes you can stay here we'll allow you to um as if this is some gracious thing and it's like well no you can almost hear her, hear her mind thinking, and I'll let you stay there. And it's just like, it's it's why on earth are you saying that this is, I'm graciously allowing you to do that. I'm This is my land too. And I, I this is where I choose to be. And it's not a, not the a, having a hand me down from the elves. Um, this is just, we're, we're equally uh, able to be here as well as you. Yeah. The- um, so go on. Uh, just standing up for the rights of humans to exist and have their own interests beyond what the elves are concerned with, too. That yeah. So much of the Silmarillion is told from an elven perspective. This is in-universe. We're told that they're mostly concerned with their own affairs, and they are just flabbergasted by the idea that humans might not be interested in looking at the world that way. Well, well, quite, yes. And that's, yeah. that's sort of a bigger issue is that all the way through, this is very elf-centric. And humans yes. are just there as being like this extra, much, much later arriving and not quite as cool or long lived or anything, therefore, you know, not, not important. Um, but talking about elves who probably think of themselves as self important, Martin S is, is wondering about the Vanyar. Um, they are presumably the highest ranked elf group. They seem powerful, being the largest part of the elves' force in the War of Roth. And they seem to have fewer nasty individuals than other elves. Well, um, I'll I'll sort of kick off on this one. I, I think so. The the Vanya, as I say, I I always think of them as the boring elves um, because they just do what they're told to do. The, the the Valar say, "Come west, come over here." They all do it. They land. They find a nice home. Manway's mountain and sort of stay there and we don't hear much about them after that we hear of a few individuals uh but we don't they don't revolt like the um uh the noldor do they uh, they're not like the teleri having their own particular identity and loving the sea or anything like that they're just pure what you would expect an elf to be does this make them the highest ranked elves um i think it depends on what you count as being highest ranked they're certainly closest to the valar um and in terms of being powerful um you're right that they i think that they were the largest part of the force from valinor but that's as much as to do with the fact i think that of the three parts of elven kingdoms that were there the Noldor, half of them had already, or most of them had already headed off over to Middle Earth anyway, so they weren't going to be part of this force. The the Teleri were not that keen on joining in because of uh, of what happened before, and so yes, they're they're the bulk of it. Uh, it's not that they were the biggest and most powerful necessarily, but having said all of that, it's very clear that when the Noldor arrive, we're told in Middle Earth that they were stronger because of the fact that they still had the light of Valinor in them, the light of the trees in them. That will be true for the the Vanyar. So they will they will have been powerful because of where they are. They're soaking up the goodness, the enrichment, the righteousness of Valinor will have made them powerful. Um, so uh what what's your take on them do you are, are you with me do you think of them as being the boring elves or do are you slightly nicer to them than i am i'm 
I do. I I think that I would much rather meet a Vanya elf than a Noldo elf. I think the Noldor, as much as I adore them, they can be absolutely insufferable. Um, they're just so wrapped up in their power struggles and their creation. There's there's a Sindarin line at one point where it's like, well, the Sindar say the Noldor need space to quarrel. That's That's the heart of their people's personality is they're always bickering with each other. That's kind of how they entertain themselves almost. They can't not be fighting over who gets what. That's what makes them so wonderful and so interesting. But I think the Vanyar, they don't do anything, but we know that Ingwe, who's the head of the Vanyar, is also acknowledged by all elves to be the high king of all elves ever, full stop. So... There's, some, there's got to be something to the Vanyar, and even though they're pretty boring in the narrative, which is understandable, they seem to have done all the right things, and therefore they don't suffer any great catastrophes that are really fascinating to read about, at least not that I know of. They're still... I, I, think, I think that good doesn't necessarily have to mean boring, and I think that we could give props to Ingwe for being the kind of Helen and I got into this a little bit on her channel we talked um about the Vanyar and how they can tend to seem boring I think the fact that they are boring is given the times that they live in is kind of an accomplishment in itself mm -hmm. uh Ingwe has managed to presumably rule over his people and keep them all happy and content and that can't be easy given the fact that even the Valar are seem to be squabbling an awful lot so I, I, sl I slept on the Vanyar for a long time, but I've come around to think that they must kind of know what they're doing. Now, on the other hand, they're, they are terribly boring to read about. <laughs> so, and, and the other thing that I like about the Vanyar is considering them as the third part in the Noldor, Teleran, Vanyar triangle. They're kind of the ones that get stuck in the middle. They're, they seek power and knowledge to a certain extent like the Noldor do. They reject Middle Earth and are the happiest and quickest to come to Valinor and start soaking up the learning from the Valar. They take it in a more artistic direction, whereas the Noldor tend to be a little bit more technological and slightly. But there's overlap between those two, and Finway and Ingwe are friends, and Finwe and Olwe are friends, and so you get the sense that the Vanyar are kind of stuck in the middle here. They're they're not longing for Middle Earth and obsessed with the ocean like the Teleri are. They're not grasping after power and becoming corrupted by Morgoth like the Noldor are. But they still have. There's a lot of intermarriage. There's a lot of trade. They there's they still care about the other two. If this is a dysfunctional family, then they're the they're the good brother who's trying to help both of their just absolute insane jerk brothers without falling apart themselves. So, I, I, in in defense of the Vanyar, I guess you could call that. It's <laughs> yeah, hard I mean, because we, we really don't know very much about them. It, you kind of just have to make it up. Exactly. And I, I think that, I mean, if, if I'm being truthful, yes, they're probably the best the best of the elves. Uh, and, and I should tip my hat to them. Uh, it's just I want a fun story. Uh, and and just just sitting at home and, and, and being good does not make it a fun story. They're, they're um, wretched to read about. <laughs> well, exactly, which is why we don't most of the time. They're just not, exactly. not on the Tolkien pages. Very, very wisely does not give us long excursus on Vanyar and high society. Yes, that would make, make for a very, very different uh, story. Uh, Lyle Hammock just saying, I want to thank you both for answering my questions. Well, th thank you. They've been fantastic questions. Um, and I have got a couple more uh, that uh, I just want to pick up uh, that you dropped on Patreon. Um, you were asking about the Palantiri, um, which Fëanor made, uh, and these, for those who are not sure, if you uh, they're those sort of crystal ball kind of seeing stones that we, we get in the Lord of the Rings. You remember Saruman uh, using them, doing that. I mean, I've still no idea how Christopher Lee moved his fingers in a way that he did over that. Really weird. Anyway. Um, Question is, um, do we know how many there were altogether and where they are? Um, is it possible that Feanor brought some of them with him? Um, and what's going on with them, basically? Well, I'll give the sort of the um, the background here again and again. Lexi, if you maybe want to add on anything to this, you want. We don't know the exact number that were made. 
uh, we're not told that exactly. And we're not told exactly how the seven that we know that ended up in Middle Earth got there. It makes sense. Maybe he brought them along with him. Uh, but it's uh, it's not it's not made clear at all. They uh, they end up in Numenor. They are given to the Numenorians by the elves, and um, then they are sort of rescued from the death of Numenor, the end of Numenor. <coughs> pardon me, by the um, the faithful. So we get the, the, the Numenorians who land and found Gondor and Arnor have these stones. And this is this is how they sort of kept track uh, with each other, or theoretically, at least that's how they did. Four of them ended up in Gondor, three of them ended up in Arnor. Now, um, as for where they were and what happened to them, a very quick rundown, and maybe Lexi, if you want to pick up on any of these that you think are particularly interesting. We had in Gondor, you have Minas... Ithil, which became Minas Morgul, that's the one that Sauron ended up uh, using in Lord of the Rings, Minas Tirith, uh, De uh, Denethor ended up using a Minas Tirith one, there was one in Osgiliath, which is halfway between the two, that was the original cap uh, uh, capital of Gondor, that one in big battles called Kinstrife, um, which was basically a civil war in Gondor, that got lost in the river. Uh, there's also the one in Orthanc that we know about. That's the one that Saruman was using. Then there were three up in the north, one with Amon Sul, uh, Weathertop. Uh, there's one in, um, and I had to write this down, uh, Elostirion, uh, and also a Numinas. Uh, now, the the one, uh, the, two of the, the two lost when Arnor fell, and they uh, they got put onto a boat and the boat sank. Uh, so two were lost there. And then the final one is still was still in the time of the Lord of the Rings there for elves to use because this was the one that was linked up with Valinor uh, apparently. And you could go there and you could look to Valinor through this. And and um, indeed the the elves that Frodo runs across early on in the Lord of the Rings they come back from. Doing. That was what they were doing. Uh, they're going to go and have a look at the uh, through uh, that stone. Uh, so uh, at the end of all of this, uh, most of them are gone. I think there are only two, therefore, that stayed in Middle Earth after all of this because they either got lost or taken back off to uh, to Valinor with the last ship. Uh, but is there anything you'd want to sort of add on? Uh, about the Paladin. I mean, they're fantastic. There's there's so much to talk about them, but is there anything in, in, that you wish to highlight? Um, For Palantiri, the two things that I like most little snippets are when Gandalf and Pippin are writing to Minas Tirith and Pippin is quizzing Gandalf about the Palantiri and Gandalf expresses the desire to take one and turn it because we know the wise can turn the Palantiri to kind of look at almost anything that they would want through time and space. And Gandalf says, would that I could take it and see the unfathomable hand in mind of Feanor at work. So uh, Gandalf is confirmed a Feanor fanboy. <laughs> so that's canon. <laughs> no, but it, it's a nice little callback to the idea that um, Gandalf doesn't uh, he's he's the white at this point so he has presumably a better memory of his time in the west than he did when he was the gray before he had kind of had his power up so it's a nice little callback because of course Feanor made the palantiri and the idea that they represent so much more than just a convenient way to communicate between military leaders. If you have the strength of will, you could potentially use them as an investigative tool, a historical tool. Like, imagine the possibilities if you could only bend them the way that you want them to bend. And then the other thing that I think is kind of funny about the plantier is that they are rather important, and we know some very specific details about some of them, but we don't know rather important things like how many there were, what rules governed the hierarchy of their use because there is a sort of hierarchy you hear about master stones and then master stones on top of master stones and like ultimate super saiyan master stones so a question of 
how they all work together, there seem to be some very intricate rules, but they're only really hinted at. And again, it's one of those issues where Tolkien writes something and then he writes something else that seems to contradict it. And then he writes a third thing, but we have no idea if he meant that third thing or not. So it's it's rare, I think, though, that we get on the one hand such specificity and on the other hand such obscurity as to how all the pieces would fit together. Yeah, and I think the best, uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, the best place to go is probably the Unfinished Tales. Uh, he's got a whole section there talking about them. And, and, and there's, he goes into some detail uh, about their use um, in, in ways that make you actually see the story in a slightly different way. In, way in that he, he describes them, and as you say, he does have different views on these things, but the, the main view he seems to put across is that they're almost like telescopes that pointing in a one and you look through it to, mm -hmm. and you, with your powerful mind, you can sort of like move forward and backwards to see how far you go and maybe link up with somebody there. Um, which means that actually you have to be looking the right way through it in order to contact or see something that's happening. If you want to see what's happening in the North, then you need to, stand on the south side of it and look through, uh, which is fascinating when you suddenly think about what happened with Pippin and he saw, and then there's like the Eye of Sauron there. And it's like, if he'd been facing the other way, he would have been looking west. <laughs> he wouldn't have seen him at all. And it's actually, it's one of those things that does make you just see the story in a slightly different way. It was, I mean, chance is, is, is a word which doesn't work very well in Tolkien's world, but it was chance that that was what he saw. Um, uh, talking of chance, though, uh, and sort of fate and free will, Caius Bellarine is asking if elves have free will or are they controlled by fate? I mean, I, my my general feel is that Tolkien, um, he, he has a, a, a typically kind of Catholic view on this, I would, I would say, which is that he seems to try to hold both things... Um, together at the same time to say yes they had free will and yet everything is mapped out everything has been sung the song of creation has been sung and yet every actor within it has the free will to to do as they wish i mean do you uh we could get very deep on this very quick but do you have a sort of a pithy comment yeah, on, there, on that very briefly one of the things that goes along with the so-called gift of men, the ability of men to leave the earth forever permanently, is their ability to alter fate in the way in ways that the elves find strange. This is, I, I think, this is, um, this is either coming of men or Ainu Lindale. It's published similarly in 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 any respect. And Eru is musing on the nature of men and the fact that he's going to have two kinds of children. He's going to have elves and he's going to have men and they're each going to have gifts, but their gifts will be different. And it says this is one of the things that drives elves. I'm paraphrasing at this point because Eru doesn't say this, but this is one of the things that drives elves crazy about men. They can't understand how creatures with more control over fate than elves have could still end up to screw up their lives so spectacularly as they do. So I do believe that elves have free will. It's pointed out multiple times that elves have choices and they make choices and they suffer consequences of those choices. But I also think that there's a certain, certain fatedness to elves that does not apply to men in the same ways. Now, what those are, I, I have no idea, but it is clear <laughs> that, that el elves have free will. Elves are also subject to fate. But elves are more subject to fate than men are in some way. Yes, I think I would. I think I would go with that. And there's, there's also with age and wisdom comes a greater understanding of the the fate of things. I, I think it's the thing I would say, which is what elves have in abundance and humans don't always. So. Um, when you get people like Elrond, who's a special case in many ways, but people like Elrond, who who feel uh, sort of, I feel it is right that this task is taken by you, Frodo. This is this is him feeling his understanding and his way into uh, into seeing the right path, um, and that that very often to sort of come with this sort of understanding of the the pattern of fate. Um, but as I say, we can get into 
very deep yeah. and murky ground quite quickly going down there. Um, I've got a couple more questions from my patrons that I want to uh, to cover. Um, I'm aware that we've been going for a, for a while now, so uh, I'm going to move through relatively quickly. I'm gonna, after that, now is probably a good time to drop any more questions in the chat. So we've got two more questions from my patrons. First from Creative Branches saying, hello all, uh, love seeing collaborative live streams. Uh, and creators supporting each other. Well, good, me too. You will see more of them on this channel. Uh, I'm interested in Morgoth's creations. What creatures were made and twisted by Morgoth? And a follow-up, how many dragons died in the War of Wrath? Um, well, just in terms of the, the dragons one, I will, I'll, I'll answer that, and then, Lexi, perhaps you want to talk about Morgoth's creations a little bit more widely. In terms of the dragons, we're, we're told... Uh, not a specific number of how many there were Morgoth um, created, but, or not created, um, he, he cannot create from nothing, but that's a digression. Um, we're told that they were many and terrible. We're told that there was a dragon host, uh, so there were lots uh, there that in Morgoth's final large army. Um, we're then told the quote that well nigh all of them were killed, which is Tolkien's way of saying, Almost all of them were killed. Uh, so there were lots and lots were killed, but a small number fled and survived. And it's that that we're, that's where we get Smaug and the, the dragons that we hear about doing terrible things to dwarves. That's where they all come from. They were ones who were created for this army by Morgoth. Um, and well, they're the descendants of uh, those who then uh, escaped away um, afterwards. So that's the dragons. Uh, do you want to sort of pick up on the first part of that about what creatures, what what else was sort of made and twisted by Morgoth? Yes. So the most obvious answer is orcs, obviously, and that's a. I, I, I'm debating on how deep to get into this. I'm going to try and keep it pretty high level. We don't actually have a clear answer. This is something Tolkien went back and forth on how he Morgoth created the orcs, whether they were just elves that he corrupted and then their children were also therefore corrupted, or if he blended them with human blood, or if there's dwarvish strains in them, or if they're animals, or if they're corrupted Maiar. All of these are at one point entertained as possible origin stories for the orcs. I tend to take the view that why not all of them? There's there's no reason why all of those can't be true, so I'm pretty comfortable with any and all of those options being true. But orcs and their subsets, goblins and so forth, other other words basically for the same animal. There's also trolls. We don't really know a ton about trolls. At one point, they're posited to be corrupted ents, which is interesting considering that they turn into stone and not into wood when the light hits them. At least in The Hobbit, that's what happens to them. We have dragons, obviously, which the first models Morgoth came up with could not fly, and then eventually he managed to solve the wing problem somehow. So we have a bunch of different dragons, worms and winged dragons, and ones with four legs but no wings, and presumably all the different variations on legs and wings of dragons that exist. We have werewolves, which are an interesting one, because Sauron, of course... Uh, takes the form of a werewolf at one point. Dragoon is a famous werewolf. Karkaroth is a famous werewolf. We still have werewolves or wargs running around in the Third Age. So they seem to be some sort of supernaturally intelligent and evil wolf. We have vampires. We don't really know where they come from. They could be likewise corrupted Maiar, so not created by Morgoth, but twisted by him. We have Balrogs, who are probably pretty much Sauron, just less smart and more fiery probably corrupt Maiar uh, originally in Melkor's following that fell with him and become creatures of shadow and flame. And I think, I mean, there's spiders, but they're pretty explicitly not creatures of Morgoth. They're evil in their own special way. I think that's all the creatures I can think of that Morgoth created. Have I left any out? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't think so. Um, the, the, there's a lot that I means the sort of the, the vampires and werewolves and things we're not really told. They're just like mentioned and then we'd move on without huge amounts of detail. The the, the implication is that again these are these are creations from, uh, from Morgoth. Um the I, I think they're keeping the number relatively small. 
works in that he does seem to uh, create mockeries of what is there. So the orcs are a mockery of elves. Um, I like the theory, Men of the West was talking about this when he was on, I like the theory that dragons are mockeries of giant eagles, trolls are mockeries of, of Ents. So uh, it makes sense that there's just a small number of, of these different things because it's like he doesn't have original ideas. He just he just creates something that's like something that's already there, but more what he wants. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think that we, we need a hugely long list uh, beyond that. I will mention the meme that was going around that geese were made by Melkor in Mockery of Swans. I like that one. <laughs> yes, that does work. That does work very well. It's... Um, uh yes i will go with that um question from um this is the final question i think from lyle hammock saying do you know uh what happened to the two swords anglicel and anguirel um which were made by aeol the dark elf from a fallen meteorite uh do we know where they are now um well yes sort of uh, on both of these um the I think the the first uh, well, I'll talk about Anguirel because uh, I think that uh, Lexi, you would probably hugely enjoy talking about the the other sword um, mm. uh, because it's got it's got quite the history. The the first he did make he made these two swords and they're both black. Uh, they are made from a, a fallen meteorite. Uh, George R. R. Martin fans will definitely I think see that he took some inspiration for the sword Dawn. From a meat fallen meteorite that was milky white sword these are black swords but i think the the inspiration and the feeling is is the same these are these are ancient these are terrible these are not like normal uh normal swords um the 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 sword anguirel was stolen by Meglin, who we were talking about um a while ago and he took it to gondolin um and he kept hold of it and he died at Gondolin, and that's the last we hear of it. So it's a short story about what happens there. The implication is that it was lost there in the, the death and destruction and ruin of Gondolin. Uh, but that is the least interesting of the two black swords. Um, Lexi, do you want to tell us what happened with, uh, with the other sword? Yeah, so the other sword gets paid by Aeol, who created it, to Thingol as a sort of tax. And it's in his armory for a while, and they give it to they give it to Beleg, isn't it, when he leaves to go find yeah. Turin. It's not something that Turin had beforehand. It's given to Beleg, who brings it to Turin. Turin's been kicked out of Doriath because he was mistakenly accused of murder, and his name's been cleared, and so Beleg is sent to go find him out in the wild, and he brings him the sword it's uh, forged from a meteorite it has it's made by ale who is not a nice character and the swords are indicated to have some sort of evil will laid upon them also ale i don't think was particularly happy about paying taxes to thingle so he probably added just a little extra kick of curse to it the sword is so this is the sword that Beleg is using to cut Turin free after Turin gets captured by orcs. I'm skipping a lot here, and I know I am. I'm, I'm trying to focus, <laughs> on, focus on the sword. No, it's, it's and fine. and the, the sword slips. It cuts Turin. Turin jumps up. It's dark. He doesn't he doesn't know Beleg has come to rescue him. He just sees someone standing over him, and the last thing he remembers is being captured by orcs. So he takes the sword, and he slays his bestie Beleg with it. It's horrible, and he cries. And, well, Turin actually doesn't cry for a long time. He just stands there in mute horror. I cried. That's what. That's who cried. I cried. <laughs> I was getting confused there. Turin eventually cries about it. And they take the sword, Aglachel, with them to Nargothrond, where it's reforged because it's gone dull after the death of Beleg. It's a very, like, psychically attuned sword. It's reforged into Gorthang, the Iron of Death. That's what the name translates to. And it becomes Turin's sword. He becomes known for it. He's famous. He's the Black Sword. And at the end, this is the sword that kills the dragon Glaurung. And then, I won't spoil it, but Turin listens to Glaurung's dying words and the dying, or the immediately pre-death words of his sister. And 
the revelations that they give him are so horrifying that he takes his sword and his sword, he actually hears his sword speaking to him, saying, I will slay thee to blot out the deeds of all those that you have slain unjustly. So Turin falls on his sword, it breaks, and the shards are laid to rest with him on Tolmor, what, what will later become the island of Tolmorwen after the rest of Valerian sinks. This is one of the few points that stands forever as a testament to the children of Hurin and their horrible, terrible fates. So I guess if you were really motivated in the Third Age, you could sail to Tolmorwen and go poking around and try and dig up the shards of Gorthang. Maybe, I don't know, reforge them, but the weapon would be cursed and it would also be mean to you. So I don't know why you would want to do that. Yeah, and and th these blades they seem to have personality. Is, is and and this is very much if you if you're a fan of other fantasy literature, if you imagine uh, Elric of Melnimbane and his his sword, which seems to have a personality. This is the kind of feel that we we've got going on here. Um, it, it is magical and it is horrific, um, uh, but there is a. A hint of a happy ending here, because this is when when he, we get Tolkien wrote a few different versions of sort of the the end of days, the final battle, Dagor Dagorath, and in in it we get Turin. Uh, surprisingly, to some, is the person who gets the the pleasure of using his sword to kill Morgoth um, at, at the end of it all. So there's a sort of a because he's he's a person who's suffered so much because of all Morgoth's lies and creations and, and all the rest of it. So the the black the story of the black sword Gurthang does have a a, a hopeful ending, if, if not a happy one. Let's uh, pick up on. I think I've got a couple things in the chat to pick up on. Scott Walker, thank you very much for the uh, the super sticker. Um, Caius Ballerina saying, does Luthien becoming mortal mean she will go to the human afterlife with Beren? Does the same apply to Aragorn and Arwen? Yes, yeah, so half-elves, um, sorry, half-elves, we're not talking about half-elves here, but you, you get, if, if uh, an elf chooses a mortal life, that's a wonderful line that uh, I think they did really well in, in the movies, I choose a mortal life. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it, yes, they are they are becoming they they that they're staying an elf. Arwen would stay an elf, but be counted as a human. That's that's the way that this works, and that will carry on into the afterlife as well. Is there anything you'd sort of add to that? No, as far as we know of human afterlife in Tolkien, which he wisely I think leaves very obscure, that's where the souls of the wives of humans go as well who have chosen that fate and it is it's like you said it doesn't change their nature as elves it just changes the ultimate destiny of their souls post-mortem yeah uh reflective rambling just saying where would one petition to have it known as the tale of beren and luthien and huan um i would i would absolutely sign up for that um, alternatively, how a woman and her dog saved her wayward, nearly dusted suitor. Yes, exactly. It's it's one of the one of the things that you further. Tolkien is sometimes, I think, rather unfairly accused of just having sort of an all male cast. But when you start digging around in the Silmarillion, um, we talked about Haleth. We're talking um, uh, here about Luthien. The, the the female characters are often a lot stronger than the male characters. Uh, reflective rambling also picking up for Shane Smith. Why isn't Ungoliant's offspring more powerful? It seems they would be just as powerful or more powerful than the eagles. Um, so the offspring Shelob is very powerful um, and incredibly long lived. And it's it's worth just I think just taking a moment to reflect that Sauron basically. Um, trusted Shelob to be guarding that part of that way into his uh, his land because he knew that you, know, you couldn't get past. Obviously, you can if you have a file of Galadriel and a Sam on your side, uh, but uh, he he trusted. I mean, did you have any thoughts on this in terms of sort of the power of Ungoliant's offspring? Yeah, I, I think the fact that Frodo and Sam 
survive an encounter with her is meant to be seen as a near miraculous, and it's only through the heavy intervention of Galadriel and the Light of Arendelle contained in the file, and probably some sort of fate thing being operant, that they manage to even get through. And it's also worth noting that she is not afraid of Sauron, and Sauron is not terribly eager to tangle with her. He, I don't think he's necessarily afraid of her, but he doesn't really want to deal with all that, as it were. So, yes, Shelob is absolutely terrifying. We also know that you know, Tolkien says she's the last daughter of Ungoliant to trouble the unhappy world. We don't know if, for me, it's hard to tell sometimes if he's using that poetically, if she's actually first generation direct directly descended from Ungoliant, or if it's just that she's a giant spider monster the way we know that there's other giant spider monsters ultimately descended from Ungoliant, but for example, the Mirkwood spiders are not that big of a deal. So it's it's hard to say, well, she's the descendant of Ungoliant, and Ungoliant was a Maya, therefore her power tier would be identical to Luthien's, slightly below Sauron's, even though Luthien beats her. You know, it gets very... It doesn't work like that. It's not a shonen, unfortunately, so... <laughs> No, no, and I, but but I think it's for my money at least. If we imagine Shelob as a just a giant spider, then I think we're completely underpowering her. She is oh, no, she's clearly a very horrific. powerful being. Yeah. Uh, Martin S. Sir, uh, quick explanation. I thought the Vanyar were the highest ranked elves as they are described as the first tribe, Noldor second, Teleri third, and because their king was high king of all elves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're you're right, definitely. So uh, we talked, or Lexi was talking about um, uh, Ingwe, the high king. Um, the, the first tribe, Noldor second, Teleri third, is as much about the order in which they arrived uh, in, uh, in uh, Valinor rather than... Um, an order of sort of importance or, or precedence, but um, yeah, if, if if you had to pick one tribe to be the top, I don't know if tribe is probably the wrong word, but if you had to pick one to be top, then yes, you would definitely go with the Vanya. Uh, Jared S, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Um, didn't see a question attached uh, to it. Kelly Johnson, Juan Amaya, or something more like Tom Bombadil. Go on then, I'll let you talk about Juan. What is Juan? Uh, so, again, something Tolkien struggled with. Huan originally is just Lord of Dogs, and he has the power to speak, and this is before Tolkien has really fleshed out his hierarchy of speaking creatures versus non-speaking creatures. So he's his initial appearance, he's just a sort of fairy tale talking animal, honestly. And later he becomes a hound of Orome given to Kelegorum, who has a great destiny laid upon him, and he's clearly not just a dog at one point. Tolkien plays with the idea of having him and other sort of holy animals, like, for example, the eagles being embodied Maiar. And then in another version, he backs away from that and even implies that they're just sort of, you know, that it's all sort of an illusion that they don't really have as much intelligence and free will as they seem to. They're just sort of devices that have been placed in the earth to... I guess, provide convenient in-universe plot points, but I don't like that idea. I like the idea that Huan is Lord of Dogs because he really encapsulates everything. Sorry, we're going to start getting sentimental about puppers, but he, he really we encapsulates everything a dog is. He's ferocious, he's loyal, except he except when he's not. You know, he does have a breaking point and he can suddenly become very terrifying. He turns on Kelegorm suddenly when he realizes that Kelegorm is not doing the right things and he is so ferocious that no one will approach him. He's sweet and he's also kind of funny. He's got these moments, especially in the Lay of Lathian where they get into a little bit more detail, where he kind of He's a kind of a goofy dog at times, and he lets Luthien ride him, which he considers like a great indignity, but he put, puts up with it anyway because he just loves Luthien so much. He lays his head in her lap and he listens to her tell him all of her woes and comforts her. And so he he's like the embodiment for me of dog. If Yavanna is like the embodiment of nature and Varda is the embodiment of light and Ulmo is oceans and change and transformation and water, Huan is the Maya of dogness. And I, that's that's the version that I think lines up most nicely with all of the different competing 
versions out there. Love it. Uh, the Maya of Dogness. Okay, I will, I will happily, happily go. That's new headcanon. I love it. Um, uh, Greet Weirwood, thank you for just for picking up. Jared S. was asking a question uh, for Mondos. He wanted to know about the mountains surrounding Mordor and how some of them aren't natural formations, possible origin or work of Morgoth. Um, uh, it's a very, it's a fascinating question because uh, Tolkien didn't go into this in any detail. In fact, I've just literally just, I knew there was a quote and I literally just Googled it because I, I knew half of it. Uh, and he says, he has one line which refers to this as saying, uh, Arid Ruin and its eruptions were a relic of the devastating works of Melkor in the long first age. So um, he doesn't go into any more detail than that, unfortunately, but the, the implication is that the shape of Mordor, it does not look natural. Um, as if you just look at a map when you get those, you know, the three sides of, of, of mountains. And the hint is that Tolkien didn't think it was natural. Um, this was uh, this was created in some way. The other or the other um, suggestion, I think, from the the map maker that um, uh, we had the map up from earlier, uh, her her view was perhaps this was formed from the. The up the world upheavals at the end of the, the first age, which we talked about, a whole part of the world was drowned. Other bits were shifted around. Um, uh, so it's it, yes, it does not look natural because this is not just a natural thing with plate tectonics moving around. This is the Earth shifting and changing, um, and so the mountain ranges are not. They don't look natural. Um, uh, oh, actually, the reflective rambling you picked up on this question as well. The the, the mountain ranges surrounding Mordor um, is it unnatural? Uh, did uh, Melkor himself raise it up? Uh, did you have anything to add on that one, Lexi? That's uh, in terms of that mountain this formations is, around Mordor. This is why Melkor is the best valor. Oh yeah, because he he makes Mordor excellent. Um, uh, fine. Uh, all right. Uh, I think uh, with that we've been going on uh, quite some time, and I don't I don't wish to keep uh, Lexi for any longer than I have to. Um, uh, oh, actually, I think we just had one more question coming in. Last question, Lyle. Thank you. Oh, what is your favorite. view? I know of of Elwing, who left her sons to be captured but protected the Silmaril. Um, go on then, Lexi. Tell tell me about Elwing. So here's the thing about Elwing. She gets a lot of hate because people see this as a choice on her part to protect the Silmaril at the cost of her sons. Elwing doesn't know that Ulmo is going to catch her and turn her into a bird. And I, I mean, don't... Why would you know that? Why would you know? No one... <laughs> I, I think I oh. I think I may have thrown the book across the room at that point. Well, Ulmo and she is turns as Ulmo does. into a bird. Um, so I see it more as... Remember, the people of Syrian think that the Silmaril is their only hope of surviving. It's the only thing that's giving them protection and blessing. Now, whether or not that's true or not, we'll, I, I get into that in other places. But the, Sil the Silmaril is the, one of the only things that Elwing has left of her family. It's something that she's been told all her life is the most important thing to her people, not just you know, to her personally, but to her people. And she's the last living descendant of Thingol. She kind of has that weight, on, uh, that mantle of leadership upon her. The other thing we have to remember is we don't know what the situation was like, but it's the Feanorians. They hit hard and they hit fast. They come up on Syrian and just raise it to the ground. It's a city of refugees and children, and probably not very heavily armed. And this is, you know, Mithras and Maglor and Amras just hardened veterans Morgoth himself would probably think twice about tangling with any one of them and they have all their people at their back and they're driven by the oath I don't know I imagine it must have been utter chaos and I think Elwing was just grabbing what she could and running and obviously she grabs the Silmaril because it's going to be important I don't even know if she knows where her sons are at this point and if I had an angry Mithros chasing me, you can bet I would rather trust myself to the embrace of the ocean. I would jump off that cliff so fast. So I think that people who s consider this to be a conscious, premeditated choice, that's not necessarily what... It's not necessarily how you must interpret the text. You're free to say that this kind of shows that she's becoming corrupted by the desire for the Silmaril, just like everyone else who comes into contact with it is. 
I have much more resentment for Dior, for whom this is an actual choice. He's given a, you know, he's sent a message from the Feanorians. They say, we're going to need you to surrender that jewel. And he has time and resources and people and defenses on his side, and he still sends them away, and they sack his city. Whereas for Elwing, she's waiting for her husband to get back. She's alone. She has no defenses. She's very young. And I think she just runs for her life like probably most of us would do and gets separated from her children. We don't know if that was intentional on her part. And she jumps into the sea thinking that she'd rather commit suicide than wait and face the scary, horrible Noldo monsters that orphaned her and sent her brothers out to die in the wilderness when she was three years old. So my... my... <laughs> And it took me a while to come to this conclusion. I used to be an Elwing hater, too, but I think that we need to give her the benefit of the doubt. She's a young woman in a horrible circumstance, and she decides to commit suicide rather than I don't know what other options she would have had at that point. So I don't know that we can judge her too harshly for that. Uh, I don't think we can judge her too harshly at all. I think the other thing that I would add purely from an Ulmo fanboy perspective is uh, Ulmo is... um, uh, he is the 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 valor, uh, other than Manwe, who knows the most of of Iluvatar's plans and thoughts. And I think that he will have been very aware of the who those two children are. And it's not just like any old random. This is Elrond and Elros. They're going to be okay. They're 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 going to be crucially important to what happens in the Second Age, which is going to be coming very soon. Um, so actually. I think that he knew, and so his role in this probably shouldn't be uh, underestimated. Uh, and they find out very quickly, Arendelle and Elwing do. They were, they find out that their children have been taken captive by the Feanorians, but that they're also still alive and presumably being yeah. fed on a semi-regular basis. So they do express concern, and they very quickly find out that at least their children are alive and being somewhat taken care of. Yes. Exactly. Um, Kelly Johnson saying uh, Melkor is the most powerful yet Tulkas is whipping boy. Uh, yeah, but it depends on which way you view it. Tulkas tipped the balance in the battle. The battle, uh, I, what I assume you're referring to, is the battle way back at the beginning of time uh, when when Melkor was fighting the, the Valar uh, and they were losing and then Tulkas came and then they, they won. He was the tipping point. It was Melkor against all of them. Uh, and uh, yes, he had a few lackeys down with him as well. But um, uh, Tulkas was the tipping point that shifted it rather than one on one taking them on. Um, OK, let's uh, thank you. I hope we're, um, uh, we're, as I say, we're, we've come up to three hours now. Above and beyond what I was uh, just, uh, hoping uh, that I would keep Lexi for, but it's been an absolute delight. Do you want to remind people where they can find you on the internet? Yes, so if you want to check out my YouTube channel, I think the lovely mods have dropped the link a few times. It's just Girl Next Gondor, all one word. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. I occasionally do things on Instagram and Reddit, but Twitter and YouTube are probably the most consistent places if you want to keep up with me. Um, just Girl Next Gondor, each word capitalized, all one word, on Twitter and on YouTube. And I'm hoping to shortly be coming out with a video at the end of this week where I rant about Finrod. <laughs> Excellent news. Uh, in favor, I hope. Um, uh, one, one, Very one much of the, so. Good, good. Uh, um, uh, one of the, the better characters there. Um, now, uh, please do go and check out uh, uh, Girl Next Gondor's channel. There is a link down in the description. Um, I hope you've been able to see her encyclopedic knowledge of um, uh, the, the elves and, uh, in particular, the Houses of Gondolin, which impressed everybody. Uh, and uh, that level of detail and uh, clarity of explanation uh, comes across in her video so please do go and check out her channel and do subscribe there um okay i will make you disappear for just one moment if uh, you're watching this back a little bit later appearing somewhere around here will be a link to some more of my live streams appearing somewhere around here will be a link to my patreon page if you would like to support this channel uh lexi thank you so much for coming on thank you everyone for your fantastic questions uh, i will be back next week with uh another song of ice and fire live stream take care everyone and i'll see you again soon <laughs>